and I have the introduction to read out in relation to the hybrid meeting. So, uh, good morning and welcome. Councillors and officers are reminded to put their mobile phones or electronic devices on silent if they have one near them, and those present in the room should face forward, speak directly into the microphone, and not place papers or electronic devices between themselves and the microphones. Please would remote participants mute microphones when not speaking, as this will reduce feedback and background noise and save bandwidth to prevent loss of connection. Members of the Council joining us remotely should leave cameras on Officers leave cameras on only for the agenda item that you're speaking to. Members of the public registered to speak for or against an application and parish and town council representatives will be called to speak after the officers have presented the application. Members of the public will be asked to leave the meeting once their item has been completed. That is those who are attending via hybrid. Uh, after each item has been presented, I will invite members present in the room to ask questions first. Those members joining us remotely will then be invited to speak, and they should indicate their wish to do so by using the raise your hand facility. Uh, the exception to that is uh, that the uh, remote members, uh, ward members, will be able to speak at the beginning of their uh, application. Only those members of the planning committee present in the room will be making the decision, and I will confirm the result verbally for the benefit of those watching the webcast. Please be aware that there can be a time delay of around five seconds whilst a remote participant appears on the screen, uh, screen and we will uh, stop for a comfort break uh, when appropriate. Uh, on that basis, I'm going to move forward. Uh, can I have authorisation to sign the minutes of the meeting of the 26th of May? So yep. moved. Thank you. Good. Uh, do we have apologies? and substitutes, please. Yeah, so we have apologies from Councillor Byrne, Councillor Curtis and Councillor Harmer. Councillor Drayson is attending remotely as the substitute for Councillor Byrne and Councillor Barnes is attending as substitute for Councillor Curtis. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't believe we have any additional agenda items and I don't believe we have any withdrawn applications either. Uh, do we have any disclosures of interest, please? Project. Just, just for um, openness, in, on the um, the new house farm application, one one of the signatories of many signatories uh, is um, Martin Saunders, who stood for Parliament uh, for the Liberal Democrats at the last election. Um, and I've considered it carefully, and it's not it's not going to bias my view. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Maitley. Ah, yes, Jim. Committee member of Bexhill Heritage, item 11. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And mm -hmm. Councillor Gray. A member of Bexhill Heritage. Thank you. And Councillor Barnes, John Barnes. I would have put it on record that I am the uh, chairman of Etchingham Parish Council. I have actually had representations from both sides on New House Farm and heard them at that Parish Council meeting. Uh, but when it came to the discussion of the planning, I declared that I was likely to be on the planning committee and therefore took no part in those discussions. So I don't believe I have uh, an interest other than uh, a personal one. Thank you very much, Councillor Barnes. Uh, so you can read an item. Sorry, Councillor Mary Barnes, my apologies. Um, since my husband has declared, um, I think... Uh, possibly I have the same um, need to just say I have an interest. I don't believe it's personal. Thank you very much. And Councillor Langlands. Thank you very much. Item 6 shows the planning application index, and that will move us on to item 7, uh, which is uh, application RR2020-2132-P, stroke stroke which is 29 Seabourn Road, uh, Bexhill, and um, here, oh, is he? Edwin, okay. Edwin, thank you very much. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, good morning Councillors. Um, the, is the presentation up on the screen, Councillor, Chairman? Sorry. Yeah.
Okay, the um, proposal is a resubmission of a previously approved scheme for replacement of a bungalow and detached garage with a terrace of three houses. The application was reported to the May Planning Committee with an officer recommendation to grant planning permission subject to a legal agreement to secure an off-site receptor site for the existing reptile population and subject to planning conditions, some of which secure mitigation and compensation measures for badgers. Members raise concern about the impact of the proposal on badgers despite being able to secure appropriate mitigation and compensation measures using planning conditions. Having regard to legal advice, members resolve to defer a decision to consider the government guidance on protected species and development. Section 5 of the guidance specifically relates to making a decision about a planning application. It says that if the proposal is likely to affect a protected species, you can grant planning permission where a qualified ecologist has carried out an appropriate survey at the correct time of year, there's enough information to assess the impact on protected species, all appropriate avoidance and mitigation measures have been incorporated into the development and appropriately secured. A protected species license is needed. Uh, it is likely to be granted by Natural England. Any compensation measures are acceptable and can be put in place. Monitoring and review plans are in place where appropriate and where all wider planning considerations are met. In this case, the crux of the matter is whether a protected species license is likely to be granted by Natural England. If it is, then planning permission should be granted for the proposal, as all of the criteria set out under Section 5 of the guidance will have been met. Legal advice has been sought on this matter, and the two responses received from Natural England have been assessed. The, the guidance does not require the local planning authority to correctly foretell the outcome of a licence application, but only to consider its likelihood. In the current case, neither response from Natural England advised the local planning authority that a future licence application would be refused. Both set out matters that Natural England will consider when an application is ultimately made and the fact that the developer, developer will ultimately have to satisfy Natural England on matters of mitigation in order to obtain the licence. On that basis, it would seem a reasonable inference to draw that Natural England is reasonably likely to grant a future licence application upon the developer satisfying Natural England that appropriate mitigation is to be provided. The developer has committed to pursue a badger mitigation scheme and the county ecologist has no objection to the scheme proposed. In conclusion, having regard to the government guidance, there is a likelihood for a licence to be granted in this case. Given that likelihood, planning permission should be granted subject to the recommended conditions. One of these is a pre-commencement condition requiring a licence to be obtained prior to any works on site. If such licence subsequently required amendment of the development scheme, then any amendment is likely to require formal approval from the local planning authority. In the event that a licence is not granted, then no development can take place and the developer is fully aware of this. The recommendation is once again to grant planning permission subject to a legal agreement to secure an off-site receptor site for the existing reptile population and subject to the recommended conditions. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you, Edwin. Uh, we have a, a speaker against the application. That's Marion Crawley. Did, Marion, did you want to come forward? Uh, after the speakers. Yeah, we'll go back in and do that. Yeah. Yes, please, yeah, come forward. You've done this before, so you're probably pretty practiced at it. I said you're probably pretty practiced at doing this, so I won't explain the procedure. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Yes, me again. In February this year, I said you couldn't be sure that a license is likely to be issued. Are you confident now? Section 1.3 of your agenda sets out that Natural England apply three criteria to applications involving protected species. The High Court ruling referred to actually states in the body of that text that local authorities must consider these criteria to come to the conclusion that a licence is likely to be issued. Section 1.4 of your pack talks about how to make your decision today. A crucial factor is that there's enough information to assess the impact. Can you honestly say that after two deferrals, you know exactly what the impact of all this will be on the species 
and on the neighbours and can confidently execute your duty. I suggest the first stage of this government guidance or standing advice has been missed completely. The first stage is to try to plan to avoid harm or disturbance. Yes, avoid it. Where in any of these papers is it evidence that avoidance is not possible? The developer and the planning officer have skipped straight to mitigation. Examples of avoidance measures are set out clearly. They are to build in a different location, to reduce the development size or alter the layout. You've heard how all the slow worms are to be completely removed and both badger sets closed. That's not avoiding harm. That's inflicting it. Avoidance is accepting that this is not a suitable location for the size of development. Avoidance is getting the developer to compromise, not make badgers, slow worms and neighbours compromise. The agenda pack says Natural England has not provided any indication, let alone a negative one, of the outcome of an application. Yet you've heard about their guidance. A 30 metre radius is required for the artificial set. You've seen their comments that the site is too small, the location for the artificial set is, quote, unacceptable, as it's too close to the original set. And you've read how they feel the development plan needs to be altered. I think Natural England have submitted very negative comments indeed, yet the planning officer says there are none. No tree survey has been done to show what the impact the artificial set will have on the silver birches. Incidentally, badgers have now dug a new latrine very close by those trees, extending the main set. The tree will be undermined by the dig if allowed. If the trees are removed, flooding of neighbours' gardens will follow. The ecological survey done in June 2021 is now out of date. More holes, more badgers and more slow worms now. The current ecologist has re-evaluated the existing information, not completed a survey themselves. Remember, the set extent is still unknown too. So the new tunnels go where? Nobody knows. The report before you says, quote, applicant has committed to pursue mitigation, so hence there is considered to be a likelihood that mitigation could be achieved. If it was sufficient for planning permission to be granted on the basis that no avoidance is considered, but that the applicant says they're committed to mitigation and that some suitable might be put forward at some point in the future and that might result in a licence, there'd be no need for Natural England standing advice. Instead, Natural England say local authorities have a duty and that duty is to be confident that a licence is likely because they believe you have or will request enough information for you to be confident. That isn't the case here. You could defer once more, I know you don't, for, for them to use Natural England's paid pre-submission screening process and bring a negotiated proposal to you once they have an indication that it's likely a licence will follow. My final point is that I've heard a clear message at these meetings. Previous grant means it should be granted again in case of appeal. I suggest that previous authority was given without any regard to standing advice, nor local policy. It was approved without survey, nor any avoidance, mitigation or compensation measures being submitted at all. Two wrongs do not make a right. You have a duty here to have your decision hold up under scrutiny of a review, if necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um, are there any questions for Marion Crawley? I think you know, we've asked lots of questions in the past, and uh, I just sort of warned to avoid technical questions. Uh, yes, Councillor Gray. Very much, Mrs Crawley. I just wonder if you could give us an indication of how much the badger have increased since we were last here. I believe you said they've built a new latrine near the trees. Have they built any other sets? And do you have a rough idea of the number of badgers? Thank you. Certainly since 2014, uh, there was no survey in 2017. Since 2014, at that time, there were six badger holes. There are now 
14. The new latrine has appeared over the last, probably, I've, I only noticed it last week, but it's in regular use and it's near my boundary, near the silver birches. And just in terms of badgers, they have had cubs. They've had four cubs. Right, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Prochet. Thank you. In your view, because you live close to the site, have badgers already been disturbed? Very much so, yes. We've, um, we've tried to report it. I've reported it myself to the council. I've reported it to the wildlife police um, who came round and were told for the slow worms when the diggers, we talked about this last time, when the diggers completely decimated the slow worm refuge, they were told the slow worms had been relocated before the digger arrived. But yes, ev everything was raised to the ground. Now, now the badgers are fairly quiet because the stinging nettles are higher than me. <laughs> it's a nice environment for them at the moment. Thank you very much. We very much appreciate you coming back again, and uh, you'll be coming our expert um, presenter, I think. So thank you for that. Thank you, um, Councillor Clark. I believe you don't have to stand up. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'll try to be brief because otherwise I'll be going over a lot of the old ground. This has been dragging on since 2015, and the site has never been developed. Yet we continue to extend planning permissions. I'm a bit concerned of the comments of the planning officer. The advice is, we assume that to England will grant the licence. We don't know that. That's their decision. You can't prejudge that. I don't like that. I don't like that at all. I think that's a bit, a bit misleading. Um, this is the third time we've met to discuss this application. I don't sense any feeling from the planning committee to grant the application from the previous two meetings. <clears throat> the site is overdeveloped on this footprint. There are even additional parking spaces. There is no way the Bradgers can live on the fringes of development. They are being driven from their preferred locations. I kept reading the policy that we were sent, and this I misunderstood it. It seems to say the planning committee, or, 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 if the planning committee or the opinion license may not be granted, they can refuse the application. That, I believe, would be the way forward and would be in the best interest of the Badgers and local residents. We're the victims of an original decision by planning, which was a very poor one. There have been many changes in membership of the planning committee in recent years. Most members were not a party to that decision. <coughs> Badgers are supposed to be a protected species. It doesn't seem that way, in my view, to this application. The decision is yours. Decide. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, we'll open it up for discussion. But just before we do, it's really important to, this was called back to committee or deferred over the badger issue. And so that is the issue to be discussed, not whether we like the design of the house or anything like that, because should, should this be refused, if, if we started on another discussion, that could cause an issue at an appeal in terms of costs and so forth, yeah, or being unreasonable. So we just have to be very careful to keep the discussion to the issue at hand, which is the reason it was deferred, which was the Badger issue. And um, uh, one other thing is that there was some discussion, you know, there was a, a presentation or a discussion on the, the advice uh, that, that everybody was sent through to read, and I'm sure everyone did. And uh, I, I put it to the officers that, that uh, should an approval be forthcoming, how could we condition this to ensure that whenever any work was done, it was properly overseen? So that's another point you might want to discuss. So you're know, having a, an ecologist on site for every stage of that, that work from clearing the land to digging. That's just a, an issue I put forward to the officers and we can discuss it and we can ask them more about that as well, just to give some, some more options. So uh, would you like to speak? Project. Just to, for clarification, because I think the debate last time was fairly confused, I, I would, well, from my point of view, um, because we suddenly realised that actually we could turn down 
the application, the actual building. Um, so in my mind, it was, well, if there was a smaller building, if it was moved somewhat, would that protect the badgers better? And of course, we haven't got answers to that, but you're saying we can't even discuss. Careful, I'm just going to ask Miles Joyce's advice on that. Uh, Miles, can you come in? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, it was deferred for a specific reason, which you set out. Um, so we shouldn't be opening it out again. Um, you're looking at what you have in front of you. Um, you're looking at this specific issue, and that was a reason for a deferral. And if you're satisfied um, that you can move to a decision dealing with just this specific issue, then you should do so. Thank you. Thank you for that. And the other piece of uh, the other piece that's in the report, which I think is important to remind everyone of, is the legal case, which basically said that the planning committee shouldn't step into the shoes of Natural England. In other words, you know, start to sort of make the decisions that Natural England would make, which I don't think really impinges on the discussion, but I think it's just worth re-emphasising that point. In other words, not start to, to um, double-guess what Natural England might recommend or mightn't recommend. Yeah? Um, yeah, Councillor Ganley. Um, but, uh, this is for Edwin, the uh, planning officer dealing with this application. Uh, it states in, under the history that um, this is an alternative proposal to RR 2020-2132P. I can't find any record of 2132. What, what application was that? Is that the same as this or more or less the same? This, this is 2132. Hmm? This is 2132. I think you've got the wrong number there. I've got 1234. Uh, the current application is 2132P. Okay, so there's still one outstanding. Uh, sorry, I, I can respond to that, Councillor. Um, yes, there is, a, there is a separate application that's, um, that a separate officer is, is dealing with on the same site, uh, but it's a different scheme, so it's uh, three detached houses. All oh, right. Um, that, one, that one's yet to be determined. It's a separate application. And it is a separate application, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, the other question I had for, for the Office of the Chairman is, under normal circumstances, uh, a replacement application for one that has expired uh, would normally be approved unless planning law or planning policy had changed to the effect that it would affect this application. Has planning law and policy uh, changed to the effect that it would change this, that it would affect this application? Um, no, I don't believe it has. Um, we've considered the application fresh on its individual merits um, and we've you know, fully considered the, 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 um, the, the wildlife issue um, and we've, we've had a, a mitigation scheme presented to us um, which, which we consider to be appropriate and we have, we have conditions in place um, to deal with um, the impact of the development on the badges. I understand, but I presume that the uh, previous application that was approved would also have considered the issue of badges. Um, it, they it did consider the issue of badges, but we, in those applications, we, we relied on um, the licensing regime to deal with, to deal with the badger issue. Um, at, that, at that time, um, the proposal was to um, close the badger sets, um, which would have been dealt with by Natural England under licence. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Drayson, did you have your hand up, or was that just you generally waving around? Thanks. Uh, Councillor Mir. Uh, a, a couple of questions for uh, Mr. Cork, please. Um, uh, Mr. Cork, uh, could you read out for us, please, the Natural England email to you of the 11th of April? It's, it's the one it's, uh, where we're saying either that they may or may not be likely to grant a license. I, th I think we need to know the exact wording of that. Oh, I can do, just bear with me a moment. Give him a second to find that. Okay, further to my email um, sent on 30th of March 2022, I have had another look at this badger mitigation strategy and consulted a colleague. 
I am aware you require comments before the 19th of April. In addition to my concerns listed below, I would like to add that the distance the artificial set is planned to be constructed from the main set is not acceptable. There appears to be insufficient space at the site. Should the badges occupy the artificial set, they will be subjected to the same level of disturbance as a natural main set, hence my caveat regarding a detailed description of construction works that will take place within 30 metres, 20 metres and 10 metres of the artificial set. Therefore, I am under the impression that the development plans will need to be altered in order to practically accommodate the badges in an artificial set on site. I am afraid until I receive a concrete licence application for this development, I cannot comment further as it would be speculations and presumptions on my part. I hope my feedback and comments have been helpful and I will await to receive the final badge mitigation licence application. Yes, uh, th thank you. And at uh, 7.5.2 of your report, you quote the county ecologist uh, recommending that the buildings are moved three metres south, that's away from the, the badger set, uh, three metres south, which would take them out of the building line, so against the character of the area. Um, well, it, it, if, if the buildings were to be moved three metres south, that would be a new application, wouldn't it? It's not something that could just be delegated to officers to deal with in the light of anything that Natural England said later. So that, that's an application which isn't in front of us and we can't decide that. That's, that's correct. Councillor Gray, did you? I thought you had your hand up. Thank you, Chair. Um, like everyone else, I've very carefully studied the government advice regarding badges. And as we all know, it says you must be satisfied that if a licence is needed, it's likely to be granted by Natural England before you give planning permission. And then it goes on to say badges could be affected if the development proposal causes damage to sets, loss of sets, loss of foraging areas, disturbance to badges while they're occupying sets from noise, lights, vibration, fires and chemical use. Having read all of that, I don't see how we can be sure that Natural England will grant a licence before we give planning permission. I think these badges are at a very serious risk of being harmed. I think they've already been harmed, as we've heard. Councillor Brocha? I think we've been put in a rock and hard place, as it were, because this is, seems to be a really strange requirement. And, Chair, you've, you've actually warned us that we should only sort of talk about badges, but we're not experts on badges. But common sense tells us that with 15 badges in this small plot, mitigation is going to be a real challenge, if practically impossible. Um, I, but I, you should just... I should interrupt you. You can talk about how the building might affect the badges. <laughs> so we are still saying no to the building based on the badges. If we make a decision, no. Are you asking me or telling me? <laughs> <laughs> well, you have to come to that conclusion yourself. <laughs> you really do. I mean, that's what the discussion is about. It's a, it's a, it's a complex and fine discussion. Yeah, I was taking you at your word that we can only talk about badges. <laughs> Talking about badges, but you can, you, they're, they're, obviously they're Im, implicit within the building. It's, it's, it's not as to whether you can't, you couldn't, for example, suddenly turn around and say, I, I want to refuse this because I don't like the look of the building or the fact that there's three, not two, uh, or something like that. Um, you know, or isn't enough parking, you, you would have to tie it in your decision into the issue on the badges. But, 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 also, with, but, with, but with also avoiding stepping into the shoes of Natural England at the same time, it's a, it's a tricky one. Yeah. This, is, this is what I mean, is because I think the feeling around the committee is that there's not enough space for these badges. Um, and that's the feeling of the committee. So if we turn it down, we're saying... We're, we're actually taking a view about the badges. But then you're saying we can't do that because that's Natural England's job. Well, it's a very fine line, isn't it? I think is the answer. It's a very fine line. And, and I, I'm not sure I can define, as chairman, I can define that line. Um, uh, you know, you can't step into the, the shoes by saying, well, this will happen to the badges if, that, if you do this. Um, and Natural England hasn't said they won't give a licence. They have said that they don't accept the alternative set. That's all they've said. Um, and it's really sad that the pre-application advice uh, wasn't sought from Natural England. And there's also this issue of the 30 metres. 
So uh, you know, that's that's potentially an area that you might want to explore. Do you want to explore that area of the, the 30 metre boundary? Yeah. So why don't we ask the officer, Edwin? Um, there's the issue of the 30 metre um, radius. Is it radius or distance that uh, that the new badger set a, a, a new badger set has to be established? Um, is there is there a, a distance from the development on that site which is 30 metres away from the, the site? Uh, that there, there won't there won't be um, in relation to current design and layout of the development. No, um, but I've, you know as part of the licence and application. Uh, I think in the in the the the, the previous email that Natural England sent, um, where they outlined what they would consider in a license application, one of the um, elements was uh, you know requiring a detailed description of construction works taking place within twenty uh, thirty meters, twenty meters, and ten meters of the artificial set. Um, so they would they would consider that under the license application. Yes, Councillor Langlands in Barnes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going back to the application of 217. Now, if it had been built out then, I'm sure we wouldn't be sitting here today worrying about the situation as it has arisen. But we're five years down the line, and with the resubmission, I would have thought we'd have to consider the landscape and the wildlife in a bit more detail at that point and look at the development and reassess whether it's appropriate or not. Um, and we're dealing with badgers and not, I feel, avoiding the issue of the building, the plan, and how inappropriate it is on that land, bearing in mind that the whole badger population has virtually doubled, and the land itself is far more, what can I say, unstable in terms of their sets and everything else. So... My concern is that we do, I feel, we do need to look at the plans in more detail um, and consider the fact that maybe they need to be changed to enable the badgers to remain where they are. If you link it to the badgers, that's fine. If you, if you, if you, cho if you chose that as a reason for, uh, for some reason for refusal, of course you don't like the design, that's not, not a good thing because you only deferred it on the basis of the badgers and at appeal, if you lost at appeal, then there'd be a pretty good chance that the applicant could go for costs basic, based on being unreasonable. Yeah, you know, we, did, we didn't defer it for those other reasons. You would have to really tie tie that to the to impact on the the, the badges, some technical reasons. That's why we need the uh, the advice of the officers and perhaps the lawyer too. Uh, let's let you just revisit that in a second, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Barnes. Yes, I rather like Councillor Prochak. I think we are in an extraordinarily difficult situation. Um, the problem, I, the problem is normally uh, you would handle this by a condition under planning law, and we are here as a planning committee operating under planning law. We are not actually operating. Um, under the environmental law because that is uh, for the statutory body uh, to exercise that. If I draw, it, it's an imperfect analogy and I'm well aware that it's an imperfect analogy, but it's a bit like um, drainage. Uh, there are many sites on which uh, we put a drainage condition in to say that that has to be satisfied before any construction takes place. Um, I personally think at the moment uh, the legal advice is that we should not substitute ourselves for the environment agency. But, and I would want to hear argument about why we cannot address this by uh, two conditions. Uh, one, the normal one, that no construction should take place until a license has been issued by Natural England. That effectively prevents development unless and until Natural England uh, 
provide a license. The other condition is clearly uh, we ought to try and preclude any work going on on that site uh, that would harm the badgers until the whole matter has been considered by Natural Inlet. If we put very tight conditions like that around, I don't think we will be being unreasonable. There is a real danger, I think, that if we substitute our judgment uh, for Natural England, uh, that an appeal inspector might actually consider that we were overstepping our role and um, actually substituting our judgment for Natural England. I listened very carefully, and I think uh, Councillor Meyer was very wise in getting the wording written out. The last sentence of that email struck me, um, that Natural England do not want to exercise a judgment until they have seen the details of the license application. They are being cautious. I think it's right that we should be cautious too. I would want the tightest possible conditions on this. I really would not want to start from where we're having to start. But we're having to start with a planning history here. And I think unless we are convinced that the conditions do not actually safeguard, uh, then I think probably uh, a very strong set of conditions uh, are the most that we should impose if we're going to conform to planning law. I'm sorry to reach that conclusion, but I have to say I think that is where our lawyers are taking us. Okay. Uh, let us ask the officers what, con what conditions exist in the current proposal and what additional ones could be put in to, uh, to cover off what Councillor Barnes has just uh, spoken about. Edwin? Uh, yes. Um, I mean, the, the first or main pre-commencement condition is the, the requirement for no development to commence, uh, including any groundworks or works of demolition until we've been provided with um, a, you know, a, bad, a badger mitigation licence from Natural England. Um, so that is the, the first and uh, main safeguard against any, any development taking place on the site and any potential impact on the badgers. Um, we also have um, conditions on there relating to the provision of the five metre wide uh, badger biodiversity habitat area across the northern part of the site. Again, that's a pre-commencement condition um, and that would need to be established, um, that wildlife corridor would need to be established again before development commences. Um, so that, that, that is in place. Um, further conditions that we have um, relating to that area include a landscape and ecological management plan um, moving forward and how that area is going to be managed. Um, but I suppose for the um, construction period itself, um, we, we could potentially add a um, construction environment management plan. Um, and this can require the developer to set out specific proposals as to how they intend to monitor compliance with the, the planning conditions and the license conditions during the construction period. Um, and that could include through the, the appointment of a qualified ecologist to oversee um, what's going on on the site during a construction period. So, Barnes. so I think one of the weaknesses of our position at the moment is the county ecologist report, uh, which seems to envisage that a mitigation strategy is possible. Um, but the, my real problem, I don't think everyone has actually addressed it, is not merely construction, but I think that no work should be done on that site that would affect badgers. Uh, so it's the preliminary period um, I, I think effectively I would like to see that site frozen until Natural England have actually considered the question of a license. And if we can achieve that through conditions, I think that is better than refusing on a presumption that Natural England are going to refuse when we have no statement to that effect from Natural England. Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Mir. Uh, <coughs> Chairman. Um, in answer to what Councillor John Barnes uh, said earlier, uh, comparing this with, a, say, a drainage condition, 
we are in a different position here in that the legislation, or we are advised that the legislation says we have to consider whether, nat whether it would be likely for Natural England to grant a licence. So we, we do have to look at what we think is going to happen in the future. I know that there is a, a decided case here quoted that we, we don't have to double-guess them exactly, we don't have to be sure or anything of that sort, but we do have to consider it likely that a, that a licence will be granted. Um, and if we don't do that, we're, we're, we're not performing our duty as required by law. I think, I think uh, following on that line, how would you articulate that? Because I think you need to say, uh, I don't think Natural England will issue a licence because... Um, well, I think, Chairman, I, I ought just to say, one of the reasons why you have drainage conditions is not merely about the site, it's about the effect on the local rivers and on the wildlife. And you frequently want a condition that there should be a connection to mains drainage, precisely for that reason, because you don't want to pollute the local rivers. Um, I, the analogy is, I accept through you, Chairman, that Councillor Mayer is right, that the analogy, no analogy, is ever perfect. Uh, but I have to say, I, I think the problem in planning law, and I welcome if the solicitor will comment, the problem in planning law is if something can be addressed satisfactorily by a condition, uh, you should not actually refuse a planning commission. And that, that is how I understand planning law, but I'm open to correction. All right, let's have uh, Miles Joyce has his hand up and then we can ask Felicity Thomas. Thanks very much. Just wanted to, on that last point, say that is the case subject to the caveat that conditions pass the six tests, um, which often boils down to reasonable, reasonableness, proportionality, relevance and enforceability. Um, just want to point out uh, conditions three, four, seven, and eight are not only pre-commencement, but the pre-commencement condition does include any demolition works, and they should not take place. Um, a construction environment management plan could also be worded in that way, um, and go into some detail about the types of things that should be included in that plan to ensure uh, best practice on site uh, during the construction period. And I notice uh, the conditions five and six, um, they're, they're pre-commencement. In fact, sorry, I do apologize. Five actually itself is also um, includes demolition. So it's, that details has to be submitted, um, and that's for the Badger Biodiversity Habitat Area. And the LEMP doesn't have a pre-commencement, uh, including demolition, but could potentially, in my view. So, I mean, there is scope here um, that we can add conditions, like a, a construction environment management plan, um, and we can look at the wording of some of these key conditions as well to make sure they cover and give protection as much as we can um, insofar as those conditions will pass the six tests. And I, and I think um, conditions three, four, five, seven, and eight all include demolition in that limitation. So, um, and others could as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Miles. I think, uh, Felicity, are you, are you with us? I am. So we have... I, we have two I'm hoping I'm on camera even. We can't see you, but that's okay. Ooh. Did you want to be seen? <laughs> well, you know, we always like to be seen, all of us, don't we? <laughs> no, Thank that's, you, it's fine. So, so we, have two, we have two positions here, really. One is uh, that, uh, that, that if, if approved, it has sufficient conditions, which includes effectively freezing the site until you know, the, the Natural England licence is approved. There appear to be enough conditions in there at the moment, and potentially... Uh, I mentioned earlier having a um, ecologist, a, you know, a professional ecologist on the site for um, for all those stages to make sure that even if a licence is issued uh, or if a licence is issued that, that it is carried out absolutely scrupulously, that there's no um, uh, potential for damage to be accidentally done during that development process. Uh, and the, the alternative is that 
there appears to be uh, real doubt as to whether Natural England, even though Natural England hasn't said they won't give a licence, they have, have they have they have indicated that there are issues around the the, the current proposed plan, which doesn't mean they wouldn't issue a uh, a licence with another plan, but it doesn't give a great deal of confidence at the same time that they would issue a licence, that they haven't indicated either way, uh, which doesn't really help. But uh, there does seem to be a question mark as to um, whether uh, the applicant could could meet the con would it, could actually produce a, a plan based on the fact that there isn't a there isn't a, a thirty metre point in the on the site that uh, from the from the development that a, that an alternative badger set could be created. So could you make comment on those two points of view? Yes. So. Uh, I think um, the way in which I can assist um, might just be to uh, focus laser like on the words that we have uh, about what our job is. And our job it, in considering this application in relation to something that may need a license from Natural England is that we we have to be satisfied that it's likely. So we don't have to be confident. We just have to be satisfied. Um, Natural England have at no time and in none of their correspondence said it's unlikely this application would be granted. What they have said is these are the shortcomings we think there could be in such an application. But. Until such application is before us, we can't say definitively. So that's the crux of the advice we've been given. Now, to my mind, I'm always thinking about how, what position we would take in front of the Secretary of State on appeal. Um, and essentially, I imagine if we refused, the appeal will be that our our refusal on the basis of not being satisfied that an application is likely to be granted. Obviously, the developer here will be saying to the inspector, there's no evidence. Natural England didn't at any time tell them it was unlikely. OK, so and, and I would be hard pressed to point to definitive evidence that made us satisfied that it was unlikely it would be granted. I know that's a bit of an unhelpful double negative. <coughs> I think the truth of this, when I'm listening to the debate, uh, I think once, the de once you are thinking of making a decision based on how you think the badgers need protecting, that is in error. Because our job is not to protect the species. Uh, but simply to consider Natural England's position and, of course, our county ecologist. Um, we've got no objection from the county ecologist. We don't have anything from Natural England that indicates that the shortcomings as they see them now could not be overcome. They clearly could be overcome in the application process from Natural England. But our job is purely to assess the planning merits and Natural England's job is to protect the species. So that that's where I think Councillor Barnes' comments are absolutely spot on, because as soon as we stray into uh, thinking about how to protect the badgers, then we are stepping into Natural England's jurisdiction. And we don't want to do that, because that's their job. And, and that was very much... Uh, the central principle of the Prudhoe case, which was you may not step into Natural England's role and you may not supervise their function. But as, as has been discussed fully, what we can do is lay under Natural England's licence process our own very tight conditions. And these conditions are very tight. You've got six conditions. Five of them address the needs of badgers. Um, and many of them, or I think all of them, are given on the basis that no development can commence until the badger needs are met. 
over and above what Natural England say in the license process. And they, at the end of the day, Natural England may require a new survey of the population. Um, it, it, it may ultimately decide that the site is not suitable, but we can't prejudge or, or pre-guess any of those outcomes. We have to leave that to Natural England. And Felicity, can we add into those conditions that require, if, if uh, it was pr proposed for approval, that a uh, qualified ecologist is there at each stage of the, the development? Absolutely. I can't see any reason why a construction management plan could not be added to the conditions. Um, any developer, and indeed Natural England themselves, when they review the, the planning permission granted with the conditions attached, are going to be very clear that this is a planning authority very, very concerned about this badger of population. So I think that comes through in the conditions. And I think, uh, yeah, Edwin's suggestion of adding a construction management plan uh, just reinforces the conditions that are already there. Uh, Felicity, we have Councillor Barnes wishing to ask you a question. Of course. Chairman, that, that confirms my view, but I would want any conditions to govern any works on the site, not merely construction or demolition, uh, because uh, construction and demolition are very precise words. I think it's preventing any work that would harm the badgers until Natural England have actually uh, considered the license that and could, issued it. That could, not would. Is, is, that an, is that an acceptable term of phrase or felicity? Yes, absolutely. And in fact, I mean, the way it's phrased at the moment in the conditions is that no development shall commence, including any groundworks or works of demolition. Um, Councillor Barnes, do you think that those words should be broader uh, so that it's clear that no work of any kind can be undertaken? My view is we need to be absolutely secure and I would like it to be a little broader if appropriate language can be found. I know Councillor Clark would normally you would wait till the end, but if you, yeah, if that's okay, yeah? If that's okay. Uh, Councillor Mir, did you have a question for Felicity or? I, I, I was just, um going to speak in support of Councillor John Barnes about saying that we, we do need to cover the situation pre-development, which does, I think, have technical terms. I, I've had an example in my own ward over the weekend of uh, developers starting work uh, to bury Japanese knotweed, in, in my case, which they argue is not development, and therefore there was no need for the development plan to be agreed first. Okay. Uh, so, other yes, Councillor Ganley. I have to say that I think it's absolutely bonkers that we are expected to guess what Natural England will do. Uh, be that as it may, um, I'm sure that lawyers would tell me my opinion is of no relevance, and they would be quite right. Um, <laughs> be that as it may, we have deferred this application twice. We have debated it ad nauseum, and I think the time has come to make a decision. We obviously have to allow Natural England to make a decision regarding badges. And therefore, I move approval. All right. Thank you, Councillor Gandhi. Is there anyone that wishes to... Uh, did you want to, did you want to uh, propose approval with those tighter conditions as, as recommended by Councillor Barnes? And, Indeed so, Chairman. Uh, yes. And also including the uh, ecologist being at each stage, of, at each stage of the work. Yes. All right, that's the proposal. Um, is there a seconder? And then I'll hear from Councillor Clark very quickly too. Do we have a seconder for that uh, proposal? Uh, Councillor Barnes is seconding. I think it's yeah. the wording does include the conditions. Okay. So, I hear that. So I, what I'm going to suggest is that the, that the exact wording of that is is uh, delegated to officers, but refer to yourselves, both of you, yeah, for for a final vetting before it goes out. Are you happy with that? Yeah. I, I, I think I'll just adopt the panel 
All right, okay, but you may just want to be sure that we need to, to look at the... Okay. I think that would be a good idea. I think you need to be... I do like that. Uh, and I'm just going to ask Councillor Clark to say a few words prior to taking a vote on that. Um, thank you, Chairman. Well, I'm a little bit, I won't say confused, but concerned. Um, we've now had two senior officers saying, because we assume, probably assume, natural England will grant a licence, then we should grant the application. They made it that simple. And then it was said, the, the, the plight of the, the badgers is nothing to do with Robert planning committee, but then they've also given the advice that we should take their advice and pass it because of the, the decision away from Natural England. What doesn't change, and I try to keep things simple, I'm not an intellectual, the size of that development means the badgers are being displaced from their, from their third location and they're living on the fringes and it will have a devastating impact on them. Now, I always thought Robert had a very high environmental concerns on Robert as a council, Maybe that doesn't affect his planning committee. But it doesn't matter what condition. Well, we won't develop it yet, and we've put extra conditions on this and that. The badgers are going to be forced out of their environment where they are now. And for me, that's not happy. I'm not happy with it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Clark. We, I, think you, I think others feel the same way, but we are also at the same time bound by um, the, the law, really, and, and the, the fact is that... It, that that decision is one for Natural England, not for ourselves, as much as we can see the, the, the issues that are there. So we have a proposer and a seconder for approval with the conditions that have been proposed. So I'm going to ask for the vote, uh, all those who may reluctantly be in, in favour of uh, the officer's recommendation, please raise your hands now. Uh, those... Those against? Five against. Uh, that motion is carried for that, uh, for that application, and I know that that is reluctantly carried uh, in a number of cases, so thank you for that, and uh, thank you uh, to uh, Marion Cawley for coming along. And I know that that's not the response you wanted, but you can understand the position of the planning committee and the, the advice and the difficulty when you have statutory constituencies to... Um, uh, we'll only go so far before an application, so thank you for that. Good. We're going to go... Uh, what I suggest we do is do Great Battle Barn and then have a break, if everyone's happy with that, yeah? Is everyone happy with that? So we're going to do uh, application number eight, which is RR2022-240-P, which is Battle Great Barn uh, in Marley Lane. Claire, you're presenting this, I yes? I am, yes. Good. Oh, sorry. Miles, do you still have your hand up? Did you want to say something, or is, it just a, is that just a legacy hand? Miles? It's just a legacy hand. It's not quite a legacy hand, Chair. It, I think it'll be a, about the next item. So my apologies. I'll lower my hand now. That's all right. Just put it up when you want to. Um, okay. Good. Uh, we, if we can have the presentation, please. Thank you. This application is for a new dwelling on land adjacent to Battle Great Barn and Marley Lane in Battle. Sorry. This, this application is for a new dwelling on land adjacent to Great Battle Barn in Marley Lane Battle. The application site is located on Marley Lane, on the east side of Marley Lane, about two kilometres from the centre of battle and about a point eight of a kilometre from the edge of the town's development boundary. It's worth noting as well that between the development boundary and just to the south of the application site, stopping short of the blue line on this slide, Battle's neighbourhood plan designates a green gap around Marley Lane and surroundings to seek to secure the openness between the settlements. 
This slide shows the blue line indicates the applicant's ownership, which includes the Grade 2 listed Battle Great Barn. It's a weatherboarded barn with a thatched roof and is currently in residential use. There's also another listed building on the other side of Marley Lane, known as Marley House. The application site is shown in red and stretches from Marley Lane back to the watercourse, and a footpath runs along the lower edge of the site. This is an aerial photograph of the application site. You'll see the, the pin there, and the application site uh, with the battle vineyard and you'll see the vines. The application site is just located to the north of that pin and uh, the nearest residential property you'll see is Windridge to the north. You'll see from the aerial photograph that the area is rural in nature with open fields, mature trees and hedgerows. There is a, a scattering of residential properties but overall, um, the location is not, sustained, not considered to be sustainable. There are no paths along Marley Lane to battle. And overall, it's considered that future occupiers of the dwelling would have to rely on the car rather than public transport to access services. So it's not considered a sustainable location. This slide is the front of the site fronting Marley Lane. It shows the building and the car parking area. A new access would be created off Marley Lane, which you can see there in red. East Sussex County Council highways have raised objection because uh, there's not sufficient, as proposed, not sufficient visibility, visibility displays for vehicles, to see vehicles travelling north along Marley Lane. It might be possible to achieve sufficient visibility, but this would require taking out the mature trees and hedgerows, um, which would undermine the rural character. The next section, the top section, shows you can see the green, uh, which is the Ismali Lane and the vegetation. And um, also you'll see that the house, the house, house is set a bit below. Uh, the, um, ha and there was a driveway going up from the house up onto Marley Lane. The bottom section uh, shows the house and the relationship with the wind ridge just to the, to, the, to the north of the site. You can just make out the dormer window on the side which will result in overlooking of Windridge. You'll, you'll note that on site, that there was some screening along that boundary, uh, but this screening could be removed at any time by future occupiers of the site, and so um, would not overcome uh, overlooking issues. The other building that you can see on the left-hand side is the listed bu building itself, the, the barn, which at the moment is set amongst open fields and obviously the vineyard and has a rural character, whilst this proposal would introduce an urban form and cause harm to the rural setting of the listed building. These are the elevational drawings of the proposed building. As you see, it's quite a substantial two-storey detached house with an internal area of 260 square metres. It's a mixture, the proposed materials are a mixture of facing brickwork and natural lime render with plain clay roof tiles and oak framing. The application indicates that there will be a number of features, uh, sustainability features, such as UPV solar panels in the back garden for the electrical charging points, and also the building will ser be served by a source heat pump. But no evidence has been submitted with the application to actually demonstrate the sustainability credentials, such as a BRIAM assessment. In any event, the sustainable design and construction cannot make development acceptable in an unsustainable location. 
These are photo montages of what the building will look like. It's set within the high wheeled area of outstanding natural beauty and within the open countryside. The proposal doesn't meet any of the local, uh, limited circumstances set out in policy RA3, to, which allow buildings in uh, the countryside. It, doesn't, so it won't support farming and other land-based industries. It's not a conversion of a traditional farm building. It's not a one-to-one -one replacement, and it doesn't meet an identified local need. Therefore, as set out in this presentation and the report before you, the recommendation is to refuse planning permission on a number of grounds, including the harm on the area of outstanding natural beauty, the setting of the listed barn, the creation of an unjustified dwelling in the countryside, contrary to local and national policies, and the introduction of overlooking into the neighbouring property and also inadequate visibility um, displays which cause raise issues in terms of highway safety. Is it done? Yes, thank you. Good, thank you very much for that. Um, Mr. Mortimer, thank you. If you come forward, thank you very much. You're speaking uh, for the application and uh, first time speaking here, so you have five minutes. When you're speaking, if you could put your microphone on and there'll be an opportunity for members to ask you questions afterwards. Okay. Uh, I hope you can keep it tightly to five minutes, because I hate asking people. Quite long, because there's an awful lot to go back again. Well, at, at five, five minutes... minutes I okay, at five, at, at five minutes, I will, I will pretty much tell you to, to wind it up. So, and I hate doing that, so I, 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 I'd, I'd appreciate um, you doing that, because I hate being rude. Well, excuse me, I might have to rush this then and read it very quickly. I'm sure there will be questions for you too. Thank you. I hope so. So first of all, good morning and thank you for the opportunity. Alison and I have been long-term residents of Battle and with your approval we hope to remain so. I intended simply to demonstrate how far ahead in terms of design quality, sustainability, environmental issues and ecology this application is compared to most that gain planning today, including some in Marley Lane. We then received the planning report, which we read with a degree of disbelief but an overriding sense of disappointment. As a result, it's become crucial to analyse the planning report in detail and set out an alternative view that we believe to be the correct one within the planning guidance. I apologise if some of this presentation is quite forceful, but we are passionate about the opportunity we have here to deliver something truly special, not just serve us, but several generations to come, and are frustrated at the way it's been treated. I've submitted two documents to you, and I hope you've been able to read them, a summary of the scheme's attributes and my initial response to the planning report. This is an extremely limited time, so I can't cover half of what I really need to. So please ask me questions afterwards if anything isn't clear or you require more information. The proposal has been designed around an extensive list of features that would form the top ten of how to build a true sustainable home and exceed best practice. They are a fabric first lead building in off-site manufactured sustainable certified materials, integrated underfloor heating throughout the build, use of heat pump technology to provide all heating and hot water, seek to generate all electricity from our own fully renewable sources on site, integrate battery storage to balance and maximise the use of renewable energy generation, provide site drainage that complies with the preferred methods in the SUDS hierarchy, minimise water usage by rainwater harvesting and greywater recycling, travel to be fully electric cars charged solely from self-generated renewable electricity, enhance green spaces and encourage biodiversity with extensive native planting and the introduction of a new wildflower meadow. The result will be a genuine net carbon zero home, one of perhaps less than 100 that have been constructed in the UK to date. So the legislative background. The first cor correspondence I received from the planners indicated that the application would be refused just on the basis it was outside the Rother Core plan development <coughs> boundary. As you know, the supply of housing land and the record on delivery of homes is far below the required five-year targets, and as a result, the fact can no this fact can no longer be used as a simple means to stop development. This was set out recently in a document by the Head of Services Strategy and Planning, and I quote, the development boundaries and related restrictions on development in the countryside must be acknowledged as being out of date under paragraph 11 of the MPPF. The general presumption in favour of sustainable development becomes a critical reference point when determining planning applications. It means that significant weight should generally be given to the benefits that additional housing would bring. If you apply this approach to our application, 
I don't believe we contravene any rules in the core strategies or the MPPF. It seems the planning office does all it can to ignore that prescribed adjustment to policy. One presumes the fear being unscrupulous developers will seek to push through poor quality schemes in the countryside on the back of the policy. But we're not developers, and this most certainly is not a poor quality scheme. Each scheme needs to be looked at on its merits. If you let this scheme form the required standards going forward, then no developer is going to be able to afford to match it. The cost would never work out on a commercial development. We now need to review the main objections in the planning report. My initial response document, I have commented on them all, but I don't have time to repeat them. I've been warned. So this is now focusing on the only ones, if correct, could be considered to weigh against the proposal. These are highways. I'm amazed it was even mentioned today. It's been withdrawn. East Sussex have admitted I was correct and said there is no splay problems. It means taking down one ash tree I've been told to take down on highways and three metres of hedgerow that is three metres deep and will be plentiful still. So nonsense, I'm afraid. Overlooking, Windy Ridge is actually 15 metres away and, it, and we comply with all design gu guidance on the statute books. Um, and both the density of the hedgerow and the lower floor level of the plot make overlooking pretty unlikely. You all saw it yesterday, how dense it was, or Tuesday. If, but if this is perceived to be an issue, not a problem. I'll remove that window, not crucial for the scheme, and then there is no overlooking. Sustainability. It should be abundantly clear. This, sustain, this scheme is as, as sustainable as you can get. Um, so the presumption in favour of development must be the starting point for assessing this application. Effect on the ONB. Please remember, this is in fact an infill development on ex-brownfield land that has been developed for the vast majority of the last 200 years, and is only as you saw it due to our stewardship. It is not pristine AOMB. The planner's statement is subjective, as they provide no evidence to back up their assertion, so it needs examination. Something can only be beautiful if someone can see it and appreciate it, or can see any harm caused to it. So it's fair to analyse how widely this development could be clearly seen in the landscape. Due to the combination of low-lying site, extensive mature trees and hedgerows that will be supplemented by new native evergreen planting. We give you just 30 seconds to wind up. You cannot see it. You cannot see it from the road. You can only see it from a short stretch of the footpath in our vineyard, and that's about 40 metres long, and you'll be in the wildflower meadow at that point. So if it can only be seen from such a limited position by so few people, it's simply illogical to claim it's detrimental to the wider AOMB. And then the appeals officer also summarily dismissed that claim on our glamping site that was approved on appeal. Thank you very much. And the set of the listing building isn't quite... Please ask questions. I had a bit more Thank to you. say I, about I, carbon I, neutral. I, I, know, I, know you had a lot to, I know you had a lot to say, and I'm sure people will ask questions which uh, give you the opportunity it, to answer well, the It things. was a lot to say, and it was because the planning report, in my mind, has grossly exaggerated but any let's, issues. Let's, let's have some... And, and, and you circulated that, and I'm sure everyone's read it too. I've got it here in front of me. So uh, we'll just have some questions to you. Uh, Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for the presentation there. May I ask, did you seek pre-application advice before submitting the application? Um, the straight answer is no, but there is a real, really good reason for that. I am involved in the construction industry. I've been interested in planning, and I've read every single planning application in our lane over the last six or seven years. I know half of them by heart. And I knew there was not a chance that the planners were going to entertain any pre-application. I did ask for consultation during the application, and I wasn't given any. I've been rebutted throughout in terms of having a conversation about what might be acceptable. There was no chance of uh, officers accepting a pre-application? No. Um, what I'm saying is I was totally aware that if I put forward a property in this location, the answer is always no. Okay. And so why was I ever going to have a pre-application when I knew... There was no way they were going to entertain it. Not, not required to have a pre-application. So you will not be surprised that the officer would recommend refusal then. Thank you. Uh, he, he doesn't, nobody's required to have pre-app. And I think, it, no, to, to, no. Be, to be fair to the applicant, it was in a sort of a, a hiatus period where we were just reintroducing it. So I think, it, you know, I think that's pretty fair. Yeah, I mean, you know. Uh, as I've, I think it's been quoted before, many applications do have pre-application advice still come in even with... With a variation to that, yeah. So, Barnes. Yes, uh, I wanted to ask you about your assertions on the tilted balance. If you've been following planning, uh, you will be aware of the Surrey Hills judgment and other recent judgments 
that have ruled it in the A and B, the tilted balance does not apply. Would you comment, please? Um, I'm not sure it's quite as straightforward as that, and I would also suggest that with 82% of Rother being an AONB, if you are simply to ignore anything as ever being buildable in the AONB, your housing delivery numbers can only go in one, one direction. Um, and if this were a pure pristine OMB, if you could sit for miles around, stand at old beautiful I think, rolling I think, hills. Uh, I think Councillor Barnes was asking you, were you aware of that judgment? I've seen it, but I don't know it in detail. Okay, so. That's absolutely true. I've been very, very much focused on what goes on in Marley Lane um, because there are several houses that have been granted permission that are nowhere near the quality of what I'm trying to offer. Uh, some other questions. Uh, Councillor Prochak. Thank you for the presentation. Um, the two things I wanted to ask about, but I'm not sure if they're officer questions or, or for you. The officers uh, criticised all your amazing sustainability in terms of carbon reduction by not having some measurement. And I was just going to ask, ask about that, if, if that's for you, if that's relevant. But also I was going to ask, there was permission on that site for two holiday lets, I think. Was that in your time? It apparently it was allowed on appeal. I think, that's, should we go for the last one first and then remind me if I forget the first? That's quite interesting because actually uh, it was for three holiday property, properties and they are in place and I suspect none of you even noticed them. And yet they were going to spoil the AOMB according to the planner. They're there and they're operating and they're full all the time. But they won't be. This, 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 this development will close those as it happens um, simply because we can only do so much at any one time. Um, but they're there, and they were in sight, and if you'd been able to look down and across umpteen layers of trees, as we suggested, you would have seen them. Um, so measuring sustainability, there are, have been dozens of ways. They've come and they've gone, and there are ways of doing it. I've done many of them myself um, in the construction industry. I've built thousands of um, regeneration housing in London and elsewhere, and we're always looking at sustainability issues. I've seen all the ways of measuring them. I haven't measured them on this occasion but I, having seen so many, I've even I've been on study tours with housing associations to Germany to look at prime examples, examples of sustainable developments. There are so many within mine, and the reason that we can offer it is that we've got the land, because you need the land to work as the carbon sink and the, and the ecology measures, that I am more than confident that it will become net, it is net zero. But if that wants to be a planning condition, if you want me to have it analysed by somebody, absolutely fine, I'll do it. Because I'm not... We're not doing this to develop, for pleasure. We want to stay on the land that we've spent 15 years making into a beautiful vineyard. Um, and so we will do whatever it needs to make this what I say it is, which is yeah. truly sustainable. So I the and I can cut our footprint to zero overnight. Right. The, the question was, have you done the calculation? So, I mean, I, I funnily enough, I had the same question, um, but perhaps in a little more detail, because when, when this uh, was brought to... Uh, I was asked whether I would call this in, and uh, my recommendation was when I read the application and what was the report, was to, to withdraw it and, uh, and, and do those calculations. Um, uh, but uh, a plea was made to the, uh, the senior officer and, and it was called in on that basis, which is also fine as well, to have a discussion about it. So my question is, what is the EPC rating of the house? You, from what I gather from that previous answer, you haven't done a, a SAP rating. I haven't, but it will fall into top category. So well, no, no, no. Um, if you've done it, you either have done it or you haven't. Border and, you, and you don't know what it will be until you've done it. That, that's the fact. Well, we do in as much as Border Oak, it is a system, and they have these houses already built. So the photo montage is somebody's real house of the same property. So they already have all of those ratings. Okay, but they haven't been produced for this application. Not say specifically. Here, to, say, I, to say, here's, here's another house that's identical, that's already been done, and its SAP rating was, you know, Zero carbon or minus half yeah. a ton of carbon or whatever, yeah? No, it or hasn't. It's, or, it's, or it's 95A or... And I, I absolutely, mm -hmm. you're criticising me okay. for that, and that's fine. I'm I just accept, asking, I'm I accept asking that you. criticism, yeah. and it's partly perhaps yeah. because I'm aware of all of these systems. I've put them into properties before. I know what they do. I just took it for granted that it would be, wrongly, that it would be obvious to everybody that you couldn't have any more. I'm not sure what else you could put on this Although scheme. It's, no, it's, but, it's, it's, you know, the, the amount of... PV cells you have has to be geared to the, the usage of the house and, and, and how it's heated and all that sort of stuff. So it, it, somebody I mean, has to do that calculation. That's been done in round terms um, in discussion with a, 
a PV manufacturer. Um, it actually goes wider than that because you are governed by what the local electricity company will allow you to put in the field um, because they will not take all PV generated um, arrays. So there is a starting point. We've already tripled that. We believe they will accept that. We will go further. We, the, the calculation will be done, and I'm more than happy to produce it under a condition that gives us at least 80% of what we need. And if it can give us 100%, it will, and hence the battery storage, so we can hold it in the property until we need to draw it down. All right, okay. I'm going to, uh, is there any more questions? Yes, uh, Councillor Maidley. Uh, yes, we've got a couple. Thank you, Chairman. Just one um, small point. In your presentation, sir, you mentioned it was an ex-Brownfield site. Could you please then expand on that? Yeah, so a brownfield site, as I'm sure you all know, is one that's been developed and has got old buildings on it, whether they're to be demolished or whatever. There have been farm workers' cottages, Nissan hut barns, and other farming paraphernalia on this site since about 1820. They, were, they fell into dis um, disrepair and were knocked down probably around about 1990. So under general accepted legislation or um, policy, once the site has reverted back to not having those buildings on it, after about 15 years, it stops being brownfield and becomes greenfield for the purposes of drainage and, and what we're talking about today. So the point I'm making is this is not a piece of classic countryside. This has always been farmland. It's always two farm workers' cottages. You wouldn't have seen it when you came to site, but the foundations and first few layers of bricks are in all the wilderness at the front of the site that we're maintaining. Um, but obviously this time of year it was overgrown, so you can't see them. But there's been two there since about 1830. Fell into disarray. Those finished in about 1945. Then farming barns are on there. They're all in the plaps. They're all in the application on the, on the history maps. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, just a couple of questions, if I may. Uh, could you tell me if there are footpaths to the west and east of the site that take you to battle, do they? Um, so through the development site, there is a footpath right at the bottom of it, about 120 metres away from where we're going to put it, that goes through a stile, runs along the nine houses that are then to the side of the one we're proposing, and takes you into Settlescombe. <coughs> um, if you then, from that one, you can also cut across the vineyard back to the Great Wood Car Park. Uh, but that's part, obviously, not on our land. Where it crosses our land, it is 10 metres from the stream that runs down there. Okay. And that will obviously be fully maintained, and that's part of the area we want to put back to Wildflower Meadow. Right. Could you just confirm? I'm really confused about the footprint of this building, and um, I'm getting different measurements. Obviously, you sent something with different measurements. Could you just clarify? Is it two storeys, one and a half storeys? What is it? Uh, is it, it like it most, a shabby it bungalow? Most, or it most is certainly it? is one and a half storeys, and you saw me shake my head perhaps when that was mentioned as two. Right. It's 6.8 metres to the ridge 6 .8. of it, to the ridge, and it sits down about one and a half metres from the road, so in real terms about 5.2 metres high as you drive down the road, but behind a hedgerow about 15 metres high. Can I just also confirm, is the overlooking window from the dormer Am I to understand that's an ensuite room? No, there are other windows, not overlooking windows. There are other windows which are ensuite, but that one is currently in a bedroom. Right. But that bedroom has a full front window that looks down the field. So I'll simply remove that out of the design. That's not an issue okay. at all. That's fine. It doesn't have to be there. Last question. Um, the historical and environmental statement regarding the listed farm. Um, Am I right in thinking that that um, has, uh, cannot, does not affect, your building does not affect that listed building? I seem to see that there's no, it's not significant and it outweighs the benefit of the proposed development. I mean, is that right? Well, I'm certainly saying that. Um, planning have tried to suggest otherwise. Um, the plot that we want to build in has always been separated on all the maps and it has an extremely mature tree line between us and the barn. We're some 36 metres away from it, which I liken to about half a football pitch. And nowhere approaching it can you get a view of the two together because there is simply too much field and hedges, etc. Unless you go back to that same footpath, and when you do and you look upwards, you will see that massive row of trees between the two. So I say absolutely not. Interestingly, the planners, in a 
recent application you may remember for a, bar, for a building to the other side of me, which is close to the Green Gap, which was only 20 metres away and five metres above our barn and looked straight into it, they deemed didn't interfere with it. So I can't quite understand the logic of why now suddenly what we're proposing does and something far worse didn't. Thank you, Chairman. Um, in your initial presentation, you said the site was a brownfield site. Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but I understood you to say in response to a member question that since the uh, agricultural buildings had been removed more than 15 years ago, in fact, 20 odd years ago, it was no longer considered to be a brownfield site, it became a greenfield site. Is that is my understanding of what you said? Correct. In planning terms, that's absolutely right. Once it's not not been, not had um, buildings on it for a long enough period of time, it's no longer considered brownfield, which, which is why I called it ex-brownfield. Oh, I understood in your presentation you called it a brownfield. No, no, I called it ex-brownfield. That's I've fine. got my hearing. <laughs> no, that's absolutely no. I, I'm not silly enough to claim something that isn't true. I'm fully aware, and I've been tripped up as someone who designs drainage from time to time. I've been tripped up before by considering sites to be brownfield and then being told, "Sorry, greenfield runoff. We're not having any of that." And that tends to be the cutoff. Around about 15 years of no longer being brown, it becomes a greenfield site. Okay, uh, Mary Barnes. Thank you, Chairman. I'd just like to ask you a little bit about where you perceive the public benefit of this building to be um, and how you rate um, the detraction from the setting of the Great Barn. We obviously visited the site on Tuesday, yep. um, but I think um, I'd like to know a little bit about how you rate the sustainability of the barn. We've heard a lot about how you think about the house and what you're going to, to provide in the house. I'm more concerned about the house in its setting uh, in the AONB and also in an area which would not normally be given planning permission. Yeah, okay. No, that's fine. Um, the, the, in, in coming up with the style of house, um, we looked around the area of battle um, and timbered houses are quite widespread. Um, they also, in my view, and you may have a different view, tend to be rather attractive. Um, and this is the country. And we absolutely fully recognise that, and we are desperate not to do anything that's anti to the country. I haven't spent all those years improving what we've got to go and ruin it. Um, we've come up with what we think is a gorgeous timber frame country farmhouse. And because it's done with lime render, green oak, all those other sustainable small element tiles, it should, it, obviously you can't avoid the fact that it's a new building but it won't strike you as an immediately new building because it's done in all of that old technology that was used throughout the 17th and 18th century. So the idea it will sit there as a gorgeous addition, if you must have a house, as a gorgeous addition. If you're not going to have any housing, then how can I compare it? It's not reasonable to do that. Um, so I think it's a super house. How it will help in time, it will help, I think, in two ways. Um, in order to build this, the barn will be sold, um, and it will be sold to somebody who wants to improve the vineyard and take that on to the next level. Um, I've done enough to prove we're capable of making world-class wines on that site. Um, they will hopefully, well, they will, Im improve the performance of the barn. I've upgraded the barn. I've put in a ground source heat pump and an air source heat pump, taking out the old oil fire heating already. It's now being fully rethatched. The new owner will hopefully fully insulate it. I simply can't afford to do that. So hopefully you get two, two gains. You'll get the barn upgraded to something that's modern standard. And then the house that we build... I was going to say in part of my presentation, as individuals, we're limited to what we can do to help them reduce their carbon footprint and help address the pressing issue of climate change. Alison and I, we're in the really amazingly fortunate position of having a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to cut our residential footprint to virtually zero, if not zero. Um, and what else can we do as individual people? What more can we do to help the planet? I know there's some other questions, but I just want to clarify something. I understood that this building was for a uh, consultant for the vineyard. That says something in there, doesn't it? The, can I answer that? I mean, you're welcome. Yes, you absolutely do. You indicated there was... 
though I, I'm going to take odds of that, apologies. I said it would be really nice, having created that vineyard from nothing with all my own hard okay. work, I indicated it would be lovely if I could be a consultant. I never claimed it to be an agricultural building okay, no, or right. to have any no, you've, clar you've clarified the point. And why it's been mentioned three times, I don't understand. Okay. That's all right. You've clarified it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Ganley. Just to be sure I haven't misheard something else. Uh, um, you st I understood you to say, <laughs> I was going to say you said, but I understood you to say that highways had withdrawn its objection. Yes, I mean, this is getting a bit controversial here, and I apologise if it doesn't... Let's ask the officer. We can ask the officer. Well, ask the officer. Yeah, yeah, I think it's best to ask the officer. I just wanted to be very sure quickly, I... Did. Very, we would normally not do this, but just to clarify that point. They, they haven't withdrawn their objection. They said that visibility could be provided, but it would remove, involve the removal of the trees and hedgerows, which would, in, in our view, obviously have an impact on the rural setting. Else. That would trigger another issue. Okay. Can I suggest you might want to read that email because it doesn't actually say that. I'm sorry, I, I have to pick on this because there was no objection from Highways until two days before the report was produced. And somebody from planning clearly asked Highways for an, for an, an, an answer. And Highways apologised for not visiting the site but felt there might be a problem. Within 24 hours I went back, had a new drawing, set the thing out on site and said, no, there's not a problem. We have to remove okay, so I one think dying a, ash tree so and three metres of hedge okay, so has this, to be trimmed back. At, at this point of view, at this point, we don't have that as a, a as we don't have the statutory constant for the actually removing their objection. I think he does. Well, we'll just have to hold fire on that. We'll just keep that to the side, I think, and uh, we'll, we'll discuss that when we discuss it. Uh, Councillor Barnes and I think Councillor Mayor. Yes, I, I just wanted to be sure I hadn't misunderstood an answer to a previous question. Uh, you are proposing to dispose of the barn with the vineyard linked to the barn rather than the vineyard linked to the new house. Sadly, yes. I would love to hold the vineyard, but I don't think it's realistic. Uh, Councillor Mayor? Yeah. Um, I, in fact, I wasn't indicating, but I'll take the opportunity. I'll take the opportunity anyway. Um, I, I, I'm just getting, getting, getting a little lost. Um, uh, accept, accepting for the moment that it's a beautiful house, which you, you've had designed, um, under which of our policies or national policies are you saying that we should be able to grant this application? Under the policy that it is totally sustainable, 100% sustainable, probably only 100 in the country like it already, and I'm more than happy to have a condition to ask for those calculations to be put in. He was asking for the, the no, specific absolutely. Policies, yes. So that is the policy that the current boundary is no longer is no longer um, relevant, and that you have to have a presumption to grant in favour of sustainable development. No, no doubt that we'll take advice on that. You're very kind, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mortimer, um, the, 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 um, the, the Chairman asked you about some EPC ratings. What, has anyone from planning actually asked you to provide those ratings? I don't think planning have asked me anything or acknowledged anything about okay. the quality of the house at all. Okay, so how can you provide figures that you're not, you don't know that you've got to provide? I think I'll, I'll hold that question. Uh, that's, I think that's wrong. I mean, you can't say that. It's up to the, we all know it's up to the applicant to support their application, and if they make a claim, they have to support that claim. It's not up to the officers for, to, to, you know, to draw more and more and more to try and get to that point. So um, I actually did ask the off, I, I actually did uh, suggest to the uh, to um, Councillor Field that they withdraw the application to get those figures done but they wanted to bring it forward to committee, so that's what happened. And uh, so they, they were actually, in a, in a way, given that, potentially given that opportunity, because I thought that would have been a very useful thing, because if you make a claim of carbon zero, you need to demonstrate that. Uh, and I can tell you as a fact, there is only, <coughs> there are, there is only one house in Rotherham in the last year that's demonstrated a, 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 none that have demonstrated a, a zero, and only one 
it's demonstrated a marginal negative. I can give you that as a fact. Uh, Councillor Barnes. Thank you. So for clarity, can I just understand that you propose to sell the grape barn and the vineyard? Really a consideration. That, it's not really a consideration for the, for the, for yeah, the application. This is a new house in the countryside. Um, but it's not. It's what he wants. What he plans to do with ours is sell them. Whatever oh, is not a planning consideration. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Morton. We've had a. You've, you've had a lot of questions. I hope they allowed you to bring forward all the, the things that you may have liked to have said but didn't have the opportunity to. And uh, thank you very much. And we're going to discuss the application. And I don't know whether it's uh, Catherine Field or Kevin Dixon who'd like to speak first. Uh, Councillor Field would like to go first if she's got a, a pressing engagement. Okay, Catherine. Okay. Councillor Field. Yes, thank you very much indeed for this. And I think you will all agree. I hope that this is a really exciting building which will be built to very high environmental and sustainability standards and indeed tick all our boxes for carbon neutrality, which, as you know, is something I am very keen on. We've heard that the footprint of the new building is 35% less than the existing Great Barn, and the ridge height is four metres lower, and it won't be seen. Um, and we've also heard that, as it's such a large site, if it does cause a problem, it could be moved back within the site. The highways question is always interesting. Um, traffic surveys show that the speed is much lower than the 60 mile an hour national speed limit, which is in force at the site. In fact, it's just above 40 miles an hour most often. I know a bit about this because some years ago, residents of this part of Marley Lane um, submitted a petition to County Council, which I did for them because I'm their County Councillor, um, to get the limit reduced to 40 miles per hour. Um, and they did it on the basis that this area is defined as a hamlet and it's therefore possible. Highways said yes to all of that. It would be possible, not a problem, except they couldn't afford to do it, but it could be implemented should the residents want to pay for it themselves. So there is some history with the speed down this road. Um, we've also heard that the three holiday lets will go um, when this house is built, and so that in itself will reduce traffic movements, and we know that the site can accommodate a large display. Interesting to observe, there is no objection from Battletown Council, even though they are operating to a made neighbourhood plan. Um, this green space, which is talked about in the report, is already built on, as you can see from the plans that have been submitted to your committee. And in fact, what this house represents isn't an intrusion into green space, it's infueling. Um, the core strategy, as we know, um, is substantially out of date, and as we also know, it's being revised, and it will be revised to accommodate much more green building principles. And lastly, I would say that there are precedents for building in this area and enlarging this particular hamlet in this part of Marley Lane. Much um, play has been made of the fact that you can't easily walk to battle from this part of Marley Lane, because it's two kilometres. I would say as a resident of battle, distance from the town centre does not at all affect how many people walk and how many people drive. An awful lot of people living an awful lot closer than two kilometres drive to Battle Centre from their homes. So I don't think that's a relevant consideration. I would agree with the applicant that this is a very spectacular building. It's well shielded. It's on a site which was previously built on. It's infilling. It's not intruding into the green space. And I think we ought to allow, or I, we, not me, you, um, should give this serious consideration, and I hope when you have done that, you will grant the permission. Thank you. And I'm do sorry, I do have to go in about 10 minutes. Uh, thank you, uh, Catherine. Uh, Councillor Kevin Dixon. Thank you, Chairman, and, and I'd like to record my thanks to, to um, Mr Hook for bringing this forward for us today. At Marley Lane, um, it causes 100% of my planning issues in my ward. Um, is it a settlement? Well, Councillor Field has just said that highways believe it is a settlement. There are around 30 dwellings below the, the green gap caused by Battle Great Wood. Um, so I think as a council we need to decide, is this a settlement or is this not? I believe it is, and my residents would believe it is a little hamlet that is outside of Battle, but its own, own, own area. And it goes across, right across my ward boundary into Settlescombe too. There's also two... Um, uh, there's two business parks, industrial estates in this area as well, so it's not the 
quite the rural idyll that's been uh, that's always been suggested. We've got Rutherford's and then the Marley Lane business park further down. This is a, a proposal which accords with this council's climate emergency um, because it is a sustainable development. It's how we want to see de dwellings built in the future. Just like Blackfriars, a little bit up the road is what we are doing as a council uh, for sustainable development. This is also a similar uh, proposition. The question for this committee is which is more important, some planning policies which may be not fit for purpose or actually genuine carbon neutral sustainable development. One thing that hasn't really been mentioned too much and, and hasn't come out is the appeal in 2017 uh, that Mr Mortimer referred to and there's not referred to, well it's, it's mentioned but not really um, gone into any detail in this report about the AONB argument for the two holiday cabins and the tent. We apparently uh, refused this at the time and was a, an agreed on appeal. Now if we are going to re refuse this on an AONB issue is that going to be a similar situation? This is not discussed, this is not, um, uh, this is not argued whether it will or not, so I think that needs to be looked at. We need to be looking at what the, the inspector actually said in that appeal. I don't think this will, uh, if we allow this appeal, uh, this uh, application, sorry, this will result in a, a, in a massive flurry of further applications down Marley Lane. This is an expensive and, and difficult um, proposition at the moment. But it comes back to a question of what is sustainability? According to the report, it appears to be um, how close you are to public transport, how close you are to the town, and whether you use the car or not. It doesn't it actually seem to refer to what the building is and how, it, how that operates and the low-carbon issue uh, advantages that, that that dwelling will give. So, and just a couple of other points that have, that have been mentioned. There's, there's something been made of no paths. Well, I live in Netherfield Hill and there's no paths there either. And there's a hundred houses beyond me further up the hill that also has no paths. So it's not exactly going to be a unique situation in battle where we have um, houses with no paths. The Green Gap is mentioned, but this is inside. This is not within the Green Gap. Uh, the, the Great Barn comes first and then this comes after. We did refuse a planning application just recently that was the other side of the, uh, into the south side of the Great Barn, but that was in the Green Gap, and that is absolutely justified to be refused. Um, and other things that in, the, in the refusal, I'm sure, can be dealt with. Um, screening can be um, secured by a condition. The overlooking can be, can be, can be secured by a condition. They are, cr quite frankly, weak, um, weak arguments to refuse this. So in conclusion, I would, I would say that this is, as, as Councillor Field says, an exciting development, something that as a council we should be encouraging, something that this is what we want built within our district, and I would support the application. Uh, thank you very much, Councillor Dixon. I think um, you're putting the case forward uh, strongly. Um, so let's have a bit of a discussion about this. Who would like to uh, kick off? Councillor Errington. Can I? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Can I just refer back to what Mr Mortimer said about the updated highways report? There was actually another email that came in probably after the report was published, um, which says if the tree and the vegetation is removed, as has been suggested below, my concerns regarding the proposed access could be allayed. But, so I'd like some comment on that, because we were looking at it with the trees, but they're saying if we take the trees away, but obviously if we take the trees away, then the house is very much exposed to the road. Thank you. Yes, that's, that's, that's spot on. That's part, part of the, the objection. They don't actually remove their objection. Um, they say it could could be allayed and part of our concern is that it, if the visibility displays are provided to, 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 to meet the highway standards then it would remove extensive the extensive vegetation along the Marley Lane frontage which again sort of undermines the rural character and nature and would make the property arguably make the property more um, visible. Uh, uh, Councillor John Barnes first then Gary. Yes, first of all, in a way I'm very grateful to the uh, two ward councillors because I, I think in a way they've, they've been more honest than the application uh, because 
to my mind, quite a crucial uh, issue here is what constitutes a settlement. I go back, really, to the start of planning, because the very first planning legislation, which was 1933, was because of ribbon development. And what you have here is clearly a number of houses beyond uh, this area, which developed, I would think, uh, pre-1930 and were the beginnings of ribbon development. What is now being argued is that because of the existence of the Great Barn and Windy Ridge, uh, that this is infill. Um, and I think we do need to decide when we're looking at this whether we think that this is a settlement, in which case I, I think the arguments are roundabout, and I've got some worries about that, but if we decide this is a settlement, um, then obviously the infill argument uh, has weight. Let me say at once uh, that I think this is an admirable effort at a sustainable building. Um, I, I have no quarrel uh, with the building itself. My worries are around about the siting. First of all, is this infill or is this not? That's a crucial issue of principle for me because otherwise we are dealing with an area of countryside in the OMB and as I've already brought out in my question uh, the tilted balance in favour of sustainable uh, development does not operate in the OMB and that has been crucially decided by recent legal judgments in the courts and um, it is a crucial consideration here. Uh, the Surrey Hills judgment um, uh, bears on this. We decided in our core strategy uh, that we weren't going to recognize hamlets. Uh, we took away development boundaries from some existing hamlets. Um, whether that's right or wrong, the core strategy is very clear. Um, on this, so we would be going against planning policy, but at least we would have some reason for going against planning policy. The other issues I just wanted to raise, I, I raise them as issues at the moment, uh, because I can see a case for, although at the moment my predisposition is against, um, I am very worried, and uh, the chairman queried the relevance of it's not the disposal of the great barn uh, that is relevant in planning terms. It's the fact that the vineyard, which is to the rear of the new property, uh, will be going with the great barn and not with the new property. What we have, therefore, is a relatively small plot on which you are putting a very sizable house. It's an attractive house. It's certainly a sustainable house, but is it over development uh, for that plot? Um, the other thing I, I am worried about, and I do understand the uh, arguments that are going on about the road, uh, but to my mind, as somebody who uses that road on a fairly regular basis, uh, people do drive along it without the care and consideration. Uh, that you would expect. So it, it does worry me, this access business. You're coming up a slope onto the road. Uh, that's always difficult, coming out of a sloping drive. And you're coming out onto a stretch of road where traffic will normally be going, um, I would think, probably in excess of 40 miles an hour, um, somewhere around about 45, I would think, from my experience driving along that road. On balance, I think at the moment I'm against, uh, but I'm prepared to listen to arguments. But I think the arguments need to be honest. Uh, they need to be about whether we are dealing here with a settlement or something that is uh, outstanding natural beauty countryside 
because if it's regarded as being in the countryside, our policy is absolutely clear and we should turn it down. So, John, just before we have, uh, we've got a couple of people banked up to speak, but <clears throat> I think it'd be useful if the officer just commented on settlements, but I will also just put a little reminder of Curlew Cottage in recently, which uh, was subject to a judicial review for that exact reason. And, uh, uh, and that was, there was quite a big discussion about that, as you remember. Uh, I'd, I'd also just like to make a point which I picked up in the applicant's uh, response to the officer's report, where he said it's not an isolated house. In fact, the officer was trying to help the application by saying it was, in law, an isolated house, because that would have triggered the, the exception paragraph within the NWPF to actually help bring that application forward. So, uh, but I think just put it to the officer to talk about that. Thank you. Yes, I'll come back on the point about it being an infill development. In, in our mind, it, it's not. It's very clearly within the countryside. Obviously, it's outside uh, the development boundary of, of our, our core strategy. strategy. Uh, but more importantly as well, we mustn't forget the Battle Neighbourhood Plan, uh, which was recently made, which drew uh, the development boundary as well. They drew the development boundary close, close to Battle, and obviously they put in the green gap in terms of, of the, I would say this is, is a collection of houses. It's, it doesn't form a hamlet in my mind. They're, as, as described in the report, they're sort of loosely knit. There's a number of, a number of properties, but they're set in spacious, spacious grounds quite apart from each other, and there's no services or facilities. For example, there's, there's, no, there's no church or, or, or shop that one would expect for, for a settlement. So our, our view is quite clear that it, it, it does fall within the countryside. Okay. Uh, Councillor Ganley. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Dixon argues that uh, condition, or rather reason for refusal number five, could be overcome by a condition. That's the overlooking condition. Um, is that correct? Or... Surely that would require, if the window has to be removed, that would require a new application. It would be a change of design, I would have thought. That's, that's correct. That, that's the view, yes. If you'd have to take out that dormer window, so the design would change. So can't. You, couldn't, you couldn't just, uh, in my mind, you couldn't put obscure glazing because there'd still be the same issue of perceived overlooking. Yes. Yeah, and it serves a bedroom. So it can't be resolved by condition? No. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, the first reading of this application, I thought it was really clear, cut and dried, should be refused. But then you start to read more carefully, and I thought, Naples, um, Battletown Council don't object. <laughs> and I thought, well, it's in, the officers say it's in the green gap, and I really recognise because we had that another application in the green gap. So actually, it's not in the green gap. So that was my first hesitation. Um, then I, I began to read about the quality of the building. And I thought, my goodness, why don't we have every application like this? Sustainable materials, grey water recycling, ground source heat pumps, electric vehicle charging points, electric vehicles to be used, carbon storage, batteries, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have Councillor Osborne on our council who's got a house like this, similar. I don't know if he's done any uh, carbon calculations on it, but he always claims that he doesn't pay very much at all in electricity bills at all in terms of energy bills. Um, so, I mean, I think the assumption by the, uh, the applicant that this will actually be carbon neutral will probably be true, and I don't think, and okay, we perhaps need a, need a, a, a sum or an approval from an outside body, but certainly with all those features, we're very, very close to it. And we can't demand these things at the moment from other developers. And here we've got a developer offering it. So that, that alone sort of made me think again. The other thing that made me think again is something Councillor John Barnes has said about what is this development. Our, our officers have clearly thought this is a new house in, in the AONB as though it was an isolated house somewhere in a field on its own, by itself, surrounded by AONB. But we know that Marley Lane is not like that. 
Marley Lane as infill development all the way along it, apart from one gap, which we must keep, and I would defend that gap totally. And as the applicant said, if you walk down the footpath at the end, you will see in front of you five properties. No, nine, he said, nine properties. So you can see that it's, it's properties all the way along there, and they're, they're huge, some of those properties. So in a way, this huge development, it, it is huge, and I'm in favour of smaller developments, but it is huge, and you, but they are, that's the character of Marley Lane as we, as we went along it. The other thing about infill and and this sort of ribbon development. It's all over, rather, in the rural areas, this ribbon development. Uh, North Trade Road in Battle, uh, Battle to Watlington, all the way along there. Um, Staple Cross, the Northern Road, Staple Cross. Look at the ribbon development along there. Uh, all the way along. So it's something we have in our rural areas. Um, so it's not the Green Gap, as described um, in the neighbourhood plan. Highways, I don't know. It's... I understood one thing from the applicant, another thing from our officers. And so that, that was a concern, obviously, on site about the, about the access. But that's now got a question mark over it. Um, and also there were pre previous permissions for two, two cottages. So in my mind, I think I would support this. <laughs> I don't think Councillor Ganley agrees with you, but I should, I should ignore the, the, the shock that he was taken with. I, think as, he should as treat, not a, I should think he should treat members with respect. I think, yes, yes, I think it, it could have been misinterpreted. Uh, yes, Councillor Mir. Uh, Chair, Chairman, I, I, I think you were right to remind us of the Curlew Cottage matter in, in, in my ward. Um, in the case of Curlew Cottage, we ultimately turned that down, there having been judicial review proceedings started against us when we, when we allowed it. In the case of uh, Curlew Cottage, that was not in the AOMB. This is in the AOMB. Um, in the case of Curlew Cottage, that was a settlement of about 145 houses, and this one is much smaller. Uh, if, if anything, the grounds for refusal in this case today are stronger than they were in the case of uh, Curlew Cottage. And we were also reminded of the case of Warren Cottage, not far from Curlew Cottage, where an inspector on appeal uh, refused, refused the appeal uh, on all the usual grounds that we're faced with uh, today. Um, and specifically, the argument about lack of housing supply is a weak one when you're talking about one house. And inspectors, in a number of cases, have, have said that but they give only limited weight to that argument where, where one house is concerned. Um, so just because we have ribbon development doesn't mean that we should have more of it. Um, laws against ribbon development were one of the first planning laws introduced before the Second World War. It was proving to be a big problem. Uh, we, we've had that. We've had the 1948 Act, and we now have our own policies um, which are designed to enhance uh, the, the AOMB and the district as a whole. And I don't think we should readily go against our own policies and, and national policies in, in this way. I, I accept completely that it's a beautiful house, and I'm quite happy to prepare, prepare to believe that it, it's e economic, uh, in terms of the environment, very, very well designed and, and very good. But the fact is it's contrary to policy. And um, it may be that our policy will change within the next few years. Um, it's a point I've raised with, with our, our policy uh, planners here. Um, it may be that we do need a more flexible policy, but for the moment we don't have it. And that policy has to be carefully considered, and we really can't make up policy on the hoof. It's not, it's not the way to approach planning. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Just a, a, a short comment, and that is, um, I presume that the reason that the appeal was allowed on the holiday cabins is because in, uh, under our hierarchical uh, system, we have um, a, a business use would, would, have, would have actually given it the go-ahead. Um, it would not have been allowed had they been for um, domestic use.
This, the proposed dwelling is, is magnificent. It, it is beautiful. And the fact that it's so sustainable uh, is, is wonderful. However, there are six reasons for refusal submitted by the planning officer. To suggest that one should approve this would require you to go against those six reasons or to find solutions to those six reasons. And I have yet to hear any solution. There is one suggestion on the highways, but that would require removing trees and a whole row of hedgerow, which I would oppose. Um, the applicant is willing to change the design regarding the overlooking objection, but that has not come before us. Uh, on the basis of the, the application before us, it is still a serious objection. Um, and, and, well, all you have to do is read the reasons for refusal to understand why this should be refused. Yeah, that's uh, some really interesting discussion uh, had because I think we're, we're very much stuck between the, the, the need to drive far more environmentally sensitive housing or, or carbon sensitive housing and uh, not just existing local policies but national policies and I think the, um, it, you know, the applicant is right that uh, the policies are out of date. That doesn't mean they're not relevant and not taken into account by particularly inspectors. But even if you default directly to the NWPF, there are a great deal of protective uh, policies within, their, in, within the AOMB. And the, and the question is, is there one that supports it? I've sort of over a period of time come to the view that you have to make decisions within policy, not from outside policy. You know, find the policies that... that that you can argue your case. And, um, and the applicant in his response, as I, as I mentioned earlier, sort of said, this is, this is not an isolated house. The, the, the um, uh, officers were actually trying to help because if it was defined as an isolated house, it would have it, you could have deferred to the exception policy within the NWPF, which is paragraph 80, uh, which, is, uh, which I'm going to read a little bit of to you because it might help you. Uh, planning policies and decisions should avoid the development of isolated homes in the countryside unless one or more of the following circumstances apply. Isolated is now defined by, by legal precedent. There have been a couple of cases which I think are referred to in the report of Bramfield, anything really away from a development boundary. And that doesn't mean right on the development boundary. It means away from it. So it can be within other houses as this one is here. And the exceptions are a need for a rural worker, um, the development would represent the optimal viable use of a heritage asset or would be appropriate in enabling development to secure the future of the heritage asset. I don't think that applies here. The development would re because the building is clearly being, you know, the, the listed building being renovated without the support of viability. The development would reuse redundant or disuse buildings. That's not relevant here. The development would involve the subdivision of existing residential building. Well, the applicant says this isn't a, a subdivision. Uh, or the last one, which is the, the key one, and this is, this is one that you'll all know because just about every uh, property on the Grand Designs Program fits into this one, which is the, the design is of exceptional quality and it's truly outstanding, reflecting the highest standards in architecture. <coughs> it would help to raise the standard of design more generally in the rural areas and would significantly enhance its immediate setting and be sensitive to the defining characteristics of the local area. And that's why you see those houses on that program. They pretty much typically all are one of those houses, uh, and then you have to tick the AOMB box and the biodiversity. And I'm not sure I read much about whether it did... Did the county ecologist make a comment on this in terms of biodiversity? I can't remember. I don't think they did. So. No, I, don't, I don't, believe, don't believe they did. Um, it's, uh, as we saw on site, it's yeah. lawned at the moment. It's lawned, so yes, I imagine. Okay. Limited. So that's... Uh, if you want to argue from within the policy, because... There is this risk of judicial review, and I think we need to be aware of that. And there's so many things we say we would like to approve, and I don't disagree with uh, Councillor Prochak in this matter, and, and Councillor Dixon and Catherine Field. And, I, and despite the fact that they, the applicant hasn't done the calculations, which I think is a shortfall, because I think if you had those calculations, say, wow, that's X, that's great, go for it. Um, it's hard, it, it's, it, it does all the things that we would like to be doing in, in housing, but you have to be doing them in the right place in the right time or with, with the rest of the package around it. 
including the A and B and the biodiversity. So I always feel very, very sort of drawn between these applications, and I think I can see that coming through in the different parts of the discussion here. So there's, there's the question. It would, be, it would be going against policy. There is no question about that, both national and local. Therefore, there is that risk of judicial review, which is not a risk that's been faced a great deal in the past, but there, it seems to be a growing, growing area. Uh, it's not helped that there was an application approved down the road in 2019. That's, but one application, as we know, we have to deal with each one on, on their individual merits. And so I think, um, uh, you know, I think the, the, the various cases have been put. Are there any other comments that people want to make? Uh, Councillor John Brown. Yes, I think I've, I've listened very carefully and I, I did think of paragraph 80 here uh, because of the quality of the design and the uh, quality of uh, sustainability in the house itself. I think what tips my mind against that at the moment is the plot size. Because once you remove the vineyard, you really have a house uh, which is going, I, I know it's some way from either Windy Ridge, 50 metres, but this is an area, when you look at that, where the houses are actually large, but on very large plots. And this would be a large house on a relatively small plot. And I have to say at the moment that tips me uh, to think that I'm going to vote against. Uh, Councillor. Oh, excuse me, sorry. I'm sorry, you, I really apologise, but you can't intervene. And that's, uh, the plot size is clearly set out in the plan, so thank you. Uh, Councillor Mir. Uh, and I, I, I just ask you um, to, to clarify whether, for the purposes of um, paragraph 80, whether this is an isolated house or is not an isolated house, because I had one going rather the other way um, in Nicholsham recently. Okay. Do you want to comment on that? Yeah. Yes, it's not in a settlement, so uh, it could, could be considered an isolated house as, as uh, put in the report. However... Officer's views is that the design isn't outstanding. It doesn't meet the high bar of paragraph 80. And it, it, is, it, it is. There's two legal cases. Bean, the, the Brown, Brownfield? Yeah, and the Brownfield one clarified. I mean, there is, there is a subjective judgment involved, that's for sure, but pretty much anything outside a development boundary, as long as it's not right up against the boundary, would be considered isolated even if there are other houses around it. So uh, the one in Curly, Co Curly Cottage, they could have sought that as an approach, for example. They could have. Anyone can have. Uh, but that's the, that, that, that is what isolated means. It doesn't mean that there aren't other houses around. With respect, it does say, in quotes, isolated should be given its ordinary, oh, this is Bramsill, objective meaning far away from other places, buildings, or people. This is not far away. And, and I might just, just add um, to what the officer told us. Um, we, we haven't seen anything from the conservation officer as to architectural merit. And uh, although it seems beautiful to me, it might not to the conservation officer. I don't know. It isn't an application that we'd ordinarily consult uh, with the final conservation conservation officer on um, so that the, the, there are no comments comments directly from them whether the high wheel unit express any views on this me. likewise they're, they're not a cons consultee on the, on this type of application questions comments yeah, tricky one uh, Councillor Stevens um, I personally like this house and I do think it would fit in and I can't see a problem with the road either. That's just my personal opinions. Well, are we at a point where somebody would like to put forward a proposal? The, uh, just, uh, just as a warning, if you want to put forward a, a recommendation of approval, we will adjourn to just discuss implications of that. We'll probably, I think what we'll probably do is adjourn, 
have some coffee, come back and, and discuss it that way. Cool thing, since we have an officer recommendation, is that we ought to test that first. And then if we decide to vote that down, then obviously we need to consider well, uh, what we're going to do next. Uh, I think two things. One, if you want to propose that, do two. I've got... Okay, and, but, and, but I've got Councillor Mary Barnes wishing to speak. And I was going to um, recommend we, we, we um, accept the okay. officer's recommendation. So uh, there is a proposal to, uh, first uh, proposed and seconded to accept the officer's recommendation, uh, and we'll see how that goes, and then follow on from that. Uh, so those in favour of the officer's recommendation, which is to refuse, uh, if you could show your hands, please. Uh, those against? Four? Did we have any abstentions? I don't think we did, no. I should have done. But well, we were going to just test the, the, the thing. So I apologise for that. But, uh, sorry, Kevin. I thought, we'd, I thought we might be actually doing another, <laughs> another thing on that. But, that, that, that. but I think it's, pretty, it's a pretty clear result. So uh, uh, the um, recommendation is for refusal of that application. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Chair, um, in, in, in giving the reasons for refusal, I... I I think the um, ground about this being uh, within the green gap in the Battle Neighbourhood Plan uh, was, was not correct. Okay. So I think uh, yeah, we're we're taking that. the vote so we can't put anything else in, but I think you, we could note, I think the officers are probably happy to note that and, because I think that was an error which they have recognised that was... was um, well, the access, there isn't a, there isn't a change from the statutory constitution. The, the highways haven't actually withdrawn their objection. They've said that that might be able to be achieved, yeah? But if, if the applicant wants to come back to directly deal with some of the issues that were raised, then, then I think it would be a welcomed application, yeah? I think so, yeah? And I think, you know, I think you've sort of understood the issues and the arguments, and, you know, if you can address those. I personally, I would have liked to have seen it withdrawn and you come back with those so we had something which, which addressed the things that have been brought up because I think they were fairly straightforward. Um, and on that point, I think we're going to adjourn for a, for a, a break. Okay. Uh, to 12 o'clock. Are we going? We're recommencing the planning committee meeting of the 23rd of June and the next application. There are two applications for this house and we're dealing with them separately because the listed one is, uh, is, is, is very much a separate application. The first one is uh, application RR2021 stroke 1573 stroke P. Now there are public speakers for this, uh, for, for uh, the parish and town council and against and for. You have, I think, all asked to speak on both applications. Absolutely welcome to do that. That's what you've registered for. But if you, uh, for some reason, decide not to speak on the listed one, just say so. Either way, uh, we, we put them all together uh, because that's how they came in, but they are being dealt with as separate applications. So, the first one is 1573P, Newhouse Farm, Sheep Street Lane, Etchingham. All right, good morning, members. This is a site that you visited on Tuesday. This one is the full application. Um, by way of update, I would just advise that we've had three additional letters of objection. Two are the ones that have been circulated to you by the objectors. A third was a new objection, but he didn't raise any new matters. It reiterated the points that are already listed in the report. Um, there is an amended site plan, and that has been submitted to correct the blue line. It doesn't change the red edge of the application site, but it corrected the blue line that denotes the uh, additional land in the applicant's ownership. I've also, I don't quite know how I did this, but I've missed an application from the site history, there was an application in 2019 for variation of condition regarding the use of the barn. That application was withdrawn, and that one has been, in effect, replaced by this application for the change of use because we felt that the variation of condition didn't resolve the issues on the site, and we requested the application for the change of use. 
So that's those points clarified for you. Right, this is a full planning application. It arises following the receipt of complaints in relation to the site and the Council's view that the operations at the site constituted a material change of use. The proposal is for use of the dwelling at the site to be a mixed use as a dwelling or as holiday accommodation with creation of an integral manager's flat um, for use of the Curtilage Barn by residents of the holiday lets at the site or occupants, guests of the house, and it also sets out the details for the land use as well, i.e. the external activities within the grounds of the dwelling. The site comprises the original farmhouse. Oh, sorry. I'm right there. <laughs> the site comprises the original farm, um, farmhouse, which is a Grade 2 listed building, and there is also a Curtilage listed barn. There are a number of other, as you can see on there, the, um, that's, the house is the, the building here. And the Curtilage listed barn is the long red one here. The application site also outlines various other outbuildings um, which you visited, a couple of holiday lets in this unit here, a couple of holiday lets in the former garage outbuilding there couple of holiday lets in the stables down in this area. Um, and then you've got the menage that you looked at with where the children's play area was. <clears throat> the uh, six holiday lets that are on the site, they are granted under the permission from 2015. The site sits within the countryside of the High Wheeled AOMB. There is an adjacent dwelling to the east within the rebuilt and converted barn, which is on there, has, it says New House Farm Barn. Um, I think that's now called the Old Grain Store. Um, and then there are commercial and agricultural barns to the west side. Open countryside with views across the valley to the south. Woodland and a field lie to the north, separating the site from Sheep Street Lane, where other dwellings are located. The site already accommodates six holiday lets with permission for a seventh unit within the Curtage listed barn, but that unit has not been developed. The existing permission has a condition restricting use of this barn for occupiers of the holiday lets only and excluding wedding events, ceremonies and receptions, stag or hen parties. Contrary to objectors' comments, there are no other restrictive conditions to control the use of the barn or the other external areas of the site. It is noted that over the last four years, there have been a number of incidents where groups have booked the whole site and their activities have resulted in noise and disturbance, compounded by the attendance of non-residents visiting the site as well. In general terms, use of the site for holiday lets, quiet retreats, or small business group training team building would be supported by policies which promote tourism and the rural economy. While in visual terms a change of use has limited impacts, the character of this countryside location is one of a tranquil rural area. Should we move on to the aerial? <clears throat> the incidents which have been irregular have nonetheless resulted in disturbance and noise in this quiet rural area. As such, it is considered that while some form of commercial use is acceptable, the use needs to be appropriate and limited to reflect its location and the tranquil character. It will be noted that it is suggested that such controls could be imposed by conditions and, as you see in the report at pages 54 to 57, 14 conditions have been set out. Since writing the report, it has also been suggested that perhaps a temporary permission might be considered that could allow the situation and condition compliance to be monitored. As set out in the report before members, the recommendation is for approval with conditions. Okay. I think we, the, the first representation is actually was to be from Paulette Barton, who's a clerk of the parish, but she's unable to attend, but she's provided a statement that the officer mm -hmm. will read out. Okay, I will read this comment out um, and reading it as the clerk. My, Mr Chairman, councillors, I am Paulette Barton, parish clerk, 
and RFO to Etchingham Parish Council. I thank you for the opportunity to confirm the resolution of opinion held by Etchingham Parish Council on the two applications before you today regarding New House Farm and previously entered onto the Rother District Council website. I stress that this is a joint opinion of the Parish Council and is not necessarily my personal opinion. Etchingham Parish Council strongly objects to both applications having taken evidence in written form, video and sound recordings and verbally on a number of occasions at minuted Parish Council meetings from the applicant, <coughs> the site manager and from local residents living in the vicinity of the site. These decisions were taken after long and detailed discussion. The original permission for individual holiday lets and the original use of the long barn was supported by Etchingham Parish Council, but the retrospective permission being sought is a major shift in the original business model, hugely detrimental to the neighbours and with an adverse effect on the AOMB. This application is not based on the business model in point two or on the reality of the business currently being conducted. The Long Barn has seen the installation of a commercial events kitchen and is advertised openly on their website as a dining party facility for, for numbers which exceed the accommodation on site. The farmhouse itself is now being openly advertised as available to let and does not remain a residential home as previously approved as part of the original business model. Excuse me. The applicant has made two recent presentations to the Paris Council at meetings in public, providing copies of correspondence with neighbours, night watchman's log, video recordings of time-stamped and dated footage of measurements taken on a digital sound level meter, supporting his verbal request for the applications to be considered favourably. Inviting questions at the end of both presentations, he responded openly. Similarly, the Parish Council during meetings in public was shown neighbours' noise and nuisance diaries kept over the last couple of years. Date and time stamped CCTV footage, which it is understood has already been presented to enforcement, clearly evidence in the paucity of quiet retreat events claimed to be the only business conducted on site. Instead, showing examples of pool parties, fire dancing, fireworks, outdoor PA systems, and overflow parking in contravention of the approved conditions. This site is in a formerly quiet and a beautiful part of the High World AOMB, where this type of business is totally inappropriate and out of place, impacting on both fauna and flora. The property is not isolated, as the site plan accompanying these applications clearly shows, particularly as the sound levels in the vicinity are exceptionally low in normal circumstances, so its use as an event centre is seriously blighting the lives of neighbours, both immediately adjoining the property and the, to the further 12 to 15 residential properties along Sheep Street Lane and as far away as the top of Burr Hill and to Parsonage Croft off the High Street in the village itself on occasion. So it is the opinion of Etchingham Parish Council that it has the strongest possible objection to these applications and ask that the original planning conditions and permission be enforced as swiftly and completely as possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, so we have two people speaking against the application. The first one I have listed is Adrian Hanstock. Are you... All right. Thank, all right. Thank you, Carolyn. Please, Carolyn Miles, please come forward. You've probably got the idea of uh, speaking from others who have been before. You know, five minutes and there will be questions afterwards if people have questions on your applications. If, they, if anyone asks a technical question, I'll refer it to the officers, not to yourself. Okay, thank you. So whenever you're ready, please. Sheep Street Lane is a tranquil country lane in the heart of the AOMB, a designated area of dark skies landscape and is protected by national and local policies that stress conservation of its natural beauty and quiet enjoyment should be the foremost consideration for planners. This is an exceptionally quiet and scenic valley. Some people ride horses and walk dogs in the lane, and there is also exceptional wildlife, including nightingales, cuckoos, and occasionally turtle doves. This serenity is valued by residents and visitors alike. The activities being proposed today are not peaceful, silent, well-being retreats, and photographs and footage made available to the committee illustrates this. 
There is a risk that if approved, the events and group activities already being held at Newhouse Farm will destroy this key objective of the AONB plan. We object on the basis that current activities are reason unreasonably harming the living conditions of residents and any further increase of use by larger groups will destroy the tranquility of the AOMB once and for all. In 2016, the planning authorities carefully considered the proposals and also the potential impact on residents and gave authority for holiday lets only. A condition was added that no events related business was to take place to ensure the site was, and I quote, considerate to the living conditions of occupants of nearby residential properties and in the interests of highway safety. This was a sensible compromise that allowed the applicant to run a business while minimising the disruption to others living near to it. There is certifiably much less disturbance from families using the holiday lets when compared to party goers. Some families we have spoken to describe enjoying paddle boarding at Bew Water, visiting the historic towns of Rye and Battle, and cycling in the surrounding areas. These visitors do contribute to the local economy, whereas those groups that remain only on site for pre-arranged events are less likely to do so. It is important to note that this location is even more sensitive today. In 2020, a residential property was built directly next door to Newhouse Farm, and you will have seen that during your visit. The business operating at Newhouse Farm has not, and I can't stress that enough, been considerate to the living conditions of neighbours. Conditions set by the committee in 2016 have been blatantly ignored and have not been enforced, despite evidence of breaches being given to officials by residents. The listed buildings, an entire site, has been adapted to create a function suite in the Long Barn, an events venue inside and out, multi-bedroomed guest accommodation in the farmhouse, has in effect turned the entire site into a leisure business and small hotel, and it is not being used as a family home. We object on the basis that the owners of Newhouse Farm have already breached planning condition. If the committee approves this application, you will be rewarding somebody who has blatantly ignored the previous carefully considered conditions for use, and this will likely undermine public confidence in the planning process. Thank you. Mentioned the people walking on the roads. Um, I would have asked the parish clerk this question. Um, what about the footpath structure in the area? Can you put, cast any light on how well used that is and where the footpaths run? I can. There's a footpath that runs direct, directly along um, the access to Newhouse Farm. And we've had occasions where there's so many cars parked in that area um, that it's quite difficult for people with their dogs and so on and so forth. There's also there's, there's a very large network of um, walkways and footpaths around there. Thank you. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we have Adrian Hanstoff. You, you understand the, the flow of things now. I do indeed. Uh, good afternoon, <coughs> councillors, chairman. Thank you very much for hearing from us today. Uh, and I'd just like to add uh, further to the objections you've heard from Mrs. Miles. Uh, first, of, first of all, we, we consider that the report before you today is incomplete and it doesn't describe the full range of activities taking place at Newhouse Farm and as have been outlined in objections. Residents have submitted multiple examples of being disturbed by loud music, parties centred around the swimming pool, examples of noise from PA systems that can be heard all along Sheep Street Lane and more widely across the valley by residents in Etchingham Village. 
and as recently as this last weekend where people could hear noise from amplified music by the swimming pool. That amplified music has been played for hours on end and fireworks and fire juggling displays have ta been taking place at night, disrupting the dark skies and the natural wildlife. Mitigations introduced, such as fitting black plastic sheeting at the boundary, have done nothing to protect residents from the noise. Designated quiet zones that you may have seen in the proposals are pointless, as there is no natural soundproofing to stop the, that noise that travels widely. And the noise management plan that was recommended by Environmental Health and a full acoustic survey to just understand what is taking place is not one of the key recommendations that you would have seen. We say as well that there's also an intrusive and polluting effect from the excess traffic caused by increased deliveries, caterers, event trucks, and people who are just visiting New House Farm for the day. The report before you refers to previous approval by the Highways Department, but that approval doesn't assess the current impact. That is from 2015 and 16. Objections that have been sent to your officials have described taxis idling at night after midnight at the junction with Sheep Street Lane that shine their lights into bedroom windows and disturb people trying to sleep. People who are lost and can't find New House Farm are knocking on doors at hours of the day that worry residents not knowing who it is in their backyard. More recently, a double-decker bus attempted to drive along the track to Newhouse Farm. It failed to navigate it and had to reverse back into Sheep Street Lane, which is quite a hazardous thing. And a 52-seater coach at Easter became stuck on the railway bridge at Church Hill after dropping off a large group who were attending for another group event. Those concerns don't feature in the report before you today. And we object on the basis that this location is completely unsuitable for a venture of this type and scale, and that the excessive volume of traffic on that single-track single unmade road with no passing point is unsafe for dog walkers, ramblers and other users, and intrudes on the privacy of residents. The report also advises you that the applicant will simply be able to let out Newhouse Farm, farm by a Airbnb if no controls uh, if, sorry, if the application is refused. Well, that's not accurate, I'm afraid. Airbnb has a strict policy that says anyone who advertises or holds events that disrupt the sounding surrounding neighbourhood or hosts gatherings of more than 16 people will be removed from Airbnb and their adverts will not be allowed. And if you turn to the conditions that are set out, 16 conditions intended to regulate activity alongside the applicant's suggested terms and conditions, we would say that they're contradictory and toothless and ultimately ineffective. As an example, Condition 5 says no amplified music can be played, but Condition 7 allows use of a portable speaker. Now, whether the music through an amplified system is fixed to the wall with two screws or portable, it is still amplified noise. And actually, that music can then be played anywhere on the site. A portable speaker could be put in any section of the area you've seen on the map. Further, Condition 8 prohibits men's health activities outside the hours 8 and 5 on Monday to Friday. But that's discriminatory as it targets one gender over another and excessive noise can just as easily come from mixed or women's groups. The condition could simply be sidestepped by giving events a slightly different name anyway. So we object on the basis that the suggested conditions are not precise, enforceable, sorry, enforceable or reasonable and can be easily circumvented. So to conclude, the committee will have no doubt read in the officer's report and perhaps hear that the focus of the business is centred on serene activities such as yoga, pilates and well-being health retreats and be invited to conclude that these are quiet or near silent activities unlikely to disrupt the peace or harm the amenities of residents in nearby dwellings and that the terms and conditions will ensure this. Well, we hope you've accepted that in reality the whole site is already being used as a party venue and is widely advertised as such on numerous social media and events websites. Large group activities, parties, celebrations, corporate fun days are taking place and we would argue that no trial temporary period of assessment is needed. Objections raised by neighbours are based on their actual experience over the past five years and corroborated by photographs and footage you've seen. 
They're not speculative concerns about what might happen. They're examples of what is currently happening and the impact on people living in proximity to Newhouse Farm and visiting the AOMB. Could I ask you to wind up now, please? Thank Last you. sentence, then, Chair. <coughs> we therefore ask the committee <coughs> refuses today's application and holds the applicant to the original 2016 conditions for holiday lets only and not events. That's a fair and practical outcome. It was the right decision then and is the right decision now. You gave permission for business use that was sensitive to the environment, but sadly this doesn't appear to be the business that the applicant wants to run. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Mr. Hanstock? Questions? No? Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your uh, presentation today. We have uh, two people speaking for the application, Mr. John Carter and Mr. Richard Upton. Who wishes to go first? You are? John Carter. Uh, John Carter, thank you. Good. Whenever you're ready. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I believe my application covers the intentions of Newhouse Farm <coughs> and the recent letter for the planning committee from myself addressed many of the claims <coughs> listed in the objections comments. The long barn hasn't got a commercial level kitchen as just suggested and there is reference to old advertising now not in place. Uh, it's not relevant and there are no outdoor sound systems apart from one orange size speaker. Uh, not allowed around the swimming pool either. We are considerate to neighbours with our practices and it is still a family home. To address one point in the initial statement, we do not allow non-residents. This is made very clear and it does not occur. Uh, the description of fireworks, amplified musical day is not the case. Um, we do not have visitors for the day. Taxis don't idle at night for us. We use one driver for a cab and another for a seven and an 11 seater. There's less traffic than the commercial buildings and farm vehicles. Newhouse Farm has been operating within the High Weald, AONB as a destination that allows people to enjoy the nature and environment, the AONB, without affecting it in a detrimental way. Before we opened, in notes, in that first 12 months of living there, that there were numerous times I heard events in the surrounding valleys before we opened. That has continued since 2017, when we opened, and it happens to this day. The council pre-application meeting gave a positive review of the use of Newhouse Farm as intended and the initial application was withdrawn due to change of legislation after change of use was needed on a house in Brighton, I believe. It's important to remember that many homes very close on Sheep Street Lane have not taken this opportunity to object as a reflection of how little impact this business has on them. There has been a push to rally objections including a letter dropping campaign of which I was made aware which still did not add any further local objection. When discussing the business with many who live as close as the majority of objectors, if not closer, I'm told they hear nothing from us, nor are impacted by traffic, sound or light pollution. And it's hard for many nearby to offer comments of support, as you can imagine, when there is such strong feeling against Newhouse Farm from their neighbours. There are many comments in the objections in the online application. There are many objections far away from the farm, and the way the business is run now means that many homes closer, such as in Parsonage Croft, cannot be hearing music from us or seeing light from us. Uh, there is definitely a case to be made for oversensitivity to this business, and also of it being perceived as a source of all sound heard in our local environment. The night manager logs and audio-visual data recorded on specifically named nights have recorded events happening far away from the farm for which we are blamed. The farm is very much a community-focused business with all team, team members being local, contractors and builders all local, chefs, treatment therapists and other young people who help in the holidays from college are all local. Cleaners and gardeners are also local regardless of cost. We direct guests to local suppliers and businesses. With the terms and conditions we have in place and a reactive speed to any potential issues, we have shown we are a responsible business and employer. There's a great deal of evidence, audio, video, written and in-text messages that back this up including to the neighbours. Providing a manager or night watchman, as in the notes, uh, does not acknowledge unpredictable and disorderly behaviour, uh, nor does the defining of quiet zones. We understand that as a holiday destination, there is a potential for sound which we manage with many mitigating practices. 
the enforcement department rather has not collected information to show there are regular noisy events according to the notes. There is a limited number of complaints from the many years of trading and mainly seem to relate to pre-COVID days when we had less stringent practices. This is a great, a great deal of exaggeration to many objections as there is not a great deal of content to present as we take such care when vetting inquiries, when booking and when guests arrived. <coughs> this weekend a complaint about people in the gardens making loud noises was investigated and found to be a group of people talking within their own lodge with occasional laughter. This is all recorded and there is data available. This is a response time of under five minutes to discover this. Again, this is a case of oversensitivity to the business, I believe, in this example. And it's not uncommon when moving next door to an established hospitality business, a business which suffered very much during the development of the grain store. And I think experienced officers have been thorough and diligent and unemotional and not affected by anything other than evidence to draw their conclusions to support this application. We're in line with rather growth and economic policies we are not in line with the local politics of a small number of households, I'm afraid. This is a remote rural location for visitors to enjoy this special and wonderful environment where they may not have such opportunities to do so elsewhere. And it's also a benefit for people to work in such a healthy environment. Can I ask you to finish up now, please? Yeah. Um, I will just add the suggestion of monitoring is acceptable to me. Thank you very much. Um, do we have any questions? Any questions? <coughs> Councillor Ganley. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Um, it, uh, according to uh, what I read and hear, you seem to have ignored uh, previous conditions imposed on, on the site. If we were to approve this application with conditions, what... How would you convince us that you would change and uh, respect those conditions? Conditions proposed that I've read are in line with <coughs> how I wanted to keep this business going. It is a quiet place and it has developed that way from its initial um, its initial start where there were no sound level conditions and these conditions are far more about sound and impact on neighbours whereas before it was about you not know, you're using the barn from the farmhouse but you didn't so, respect those conditions why would we expect be expected to believe that you respect future conditions these conditions relate very much to how we're operating at the moment with sound controls, with on-site managers, night watchmen, and constant CCTV and audio monitoring. Uh, uh, Councillor Maisley first, and I think Pro Jackson. Thank you, Chairman. Good afternoon. Um, just one quick question. Do you have a licence for wedding ceremonies? No, we don't hold wedding ceremonies. We don't have stag do's. We don't do wedding receptions. Thank you. The I think, yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Um, it's kind of linked with what Councillor Ganley was talking about, is that actually the conditions that we set for the first permission, the existing permission, were actually very, very light. We were worried, I think, I can remember the planning application, we were worried about particularly weddings and that kind of event, which you weren't allowed to do. Um, have you had a look at the proposed conditions? Because this is our opportunity to say we will have more conditions. You, you're saying that you operate under those at the moment, so you would have no problem in actually complying with the, the proposed conditions? Yes, with um, uh, Mike Dade, who's the planning person who's been helping me, I have been through the conditions and they are in line with how I operate at the moment. So it's a very monitored site, very closely monitored site. Any other questions? Councillor Langlands. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, yeah, I, I've got a question. You made a point when you gave your presentation about considering planning policy as opposed to um, some of your neighbours, a few neighbours. Well, I see rather a lot of people sitting here in this room, which does give me some concern that you've probably impacted on quite a few of your neighbours. If they come and talk to you with regards to the, the, the issues that they have, how, how amenable are you? How accepting of those problems have you had and how do you alleviate them? I am wholly amenable to people approaching me to talk with me about it. Nobody has. I am doing this audio and control of traffic, etc., of my own volition. And even the new residents right next door, um, via text, have contacted a few times. And I've immediately responded, immediately got in touch with people on site, and always um, done my utmost including this weekend, when I found there were some people talking in their lodge with occasional laughter, and I got a text at 12.30 a.m. to alert me to that, being told that they were out making noise in the garden. CCTV disproved this. So I am... Sorry. So can I just say, then, do you... You're not on site, presumably, so... You're... I am sometimes, but as a manager, if I'm not. Right. And uh, also have night watchmen as well. So they, that's how I knew. He immediately went to go and find out. And also from CCTV, I saw it. Okay, thank you. It's 24 hours and it's accessible anywhere. Thank you. Councillor Barnes. Yes, hello, John. Um, when I was District Councillor for Ettingham, and you and I discussed the application right at the beginning, we talked about how important it was that the beauty and the tranquility of of that particular part of Ettingham, that ridge was maintained at all times. And remember, we talked about how lovely it would be for people to come and enjoy the, that, particularly if they came from London, and so they would be able to enjoy the quietness. Um, we talked about how they would also be able to use some of the local farm shops the, and, and, and the local facilities, which we all very much enjoy. Um, I have to say that I am not troubled by the noise, but I have heard on so many different occasions um, that far from your assertion that it is not creating a problem, I can assure you it's creating a huge problem. And I am very, very disappointed um, that you don't recognise that. It's almost as if you have forgotten that earlier conversation that we had. Um, I would ask you, please, to consider going back to the terms and conditions of that first planning application um, to realise that it is important for everyone in Sheep Street Lane that we have peace, we have quiet, and that you are considerate to the needs of the local um, neighbourhood, uh, particularly for that end of, of, uh, of Sheep Street Lane. Is there a, sorry, Mary, is there a question? My question is, would you please abide by that? Uh, abide by to show more consideration and keep in peace and quiet. Indeed. It's my, my complete intent to do so as much as possible. Can I just ask you if you are aware that there is tremendous, tremendous problems with the noise that your advertised uh, events programme is creating uh, for, 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 for the neighbourhood? I'm I'm very aware because of the esteemed neighbours behind me. Um, the, the amount of times I go out and recording audio levels and seeing where the noise reaches, I do find it hard to correlate with the objections, although I'm not saying I disbelieve, but I have got so many audio recordings on Sheep Street Lane that just have no sound levels from the barn and how they can be affecting. As my honest, genuine <coughs> opinion. Um, yeah. Surely you realise that if you have advertised an events-based uh, business, it's not the same as running a... a, a, a 
a, a quiet six unit um, a business, which is what you and I talked about yeah. in 2015. It has changed out of all recognition. Would you agree to that? I, I, it has changed. It had to change because it wasn't sustainable in a way that it could continue. But previous advertising, I think, and also there's a lot of advertising you get online that isn't even where people put your venue on their websites. I only use two listings, and I've altered all of that advertising. And Instagram, all those things where there's lots of people gathering, has all been removed. And I've found two websites I've made them removers from. Uh, I do see that it's changed. I do recognize that. And that's why I'm far stricter with the sound level mitigation than was previously in place to balance that out. question could you advise me the, the house how many bedrooms is that got the main house um seven bedrooms and then the proposal also has a bedroom for the manager's flat okay so the seven bedrooms are they let do, do you would you is your intention to let that as individual bedrooms or would you be letting that oh no it's only room? no it's just the one it's usually um families that have younger children that want to be together in the same place that's still, but there are seven bedrooms, so it's still quite a big family group that would come there, or a yes, and group. they'd know each other, right? But a corporate group, would you let that out to a corporate group? That's what I'm just trying to understand. Oh, I see. Um, a corporate group, which is a very good group to have in because they're lower numbers and they, they'd like to have one bedroom per person, so that they tend to be especially with, with retreats, similar numbers just for attention levels, they're about 15 16 people. 15 is the ideal number. Thank you. John, thank you for your presentation. How would you react to um, a charge from me that you were very much in denial? Um, we have an awful lot of evidence that a lot of local people are um, being disturbed fairly regularly by the activities of your business. Um, you deny that. What is the motivation of these people if it isn't genuine? Are, are they motivated by prejudice, by malice? What, why, are they, why are they saying these things if they're not true? I, it's a difficult question to address because I can't really um, accuse anyone of malice. All I can do is just refer to the data, which does show very little sound travel. Um, there's, since having people on night watch, since last September, there's been very, very low occasions where people are even outside making noise because they're moved in. Um, I previously worked in music <coughs> as a DJ and also before I even moved to Sheep Street Lane, there was a campaign because I heard from other residents saying how bad it was going to be. And that hasn't really abated. That's all I could really say. I hope I'm not in denial because I do just recall so much data again and again to find sound levels, to find where there are issues. I can see there's a big issue with Newhouse Farm. However, I can't correlate it with what the data says. And I, if I could, I would change it. Thank you. Councillor John Barnes? I think last question, then we'll move on to the next speaker. I think, John, I would quite like you to comment on the sort of events uh, that you're getting. Um, you advertise, as I saw on your website, that you let the whole site for £6,000 a weekend. Um, you're proposing to have bedrooms in the basement of the farmhouse. Uh, I notice you have bedrooms on the ground floor. What is the maximum number of people who could attend an event like that? Um, I, as I do not like to have more than um, 30 people now. That's for the crowd that we were getting 
as we've got more and more repeat custom, it's around that number or less, because obviously with retreats in the corporates, um, the basement is a lounge which can, can allow for another person. Uh, the types of events are family gatherings, low-key family gatherings. Everyone is very, no one can book without speaking to me. And they are told in the strictest terms that this is not a noisy venue. Uh, so we get more things like 80th, 70th families on multi-generations coming together, uh, the corporate groups. There's um, retreats as well. It's been a very hard um, post-COVID time to navigate, actually, with the groups. And it's still, I have turned down countless, countless, countless requests for noisy parties. And actually, for the first time four weeks ago, um, somebody brought in a stereo system and were just so noisy. And we had to actually ask them to leave the next day because they were breaking all the terms and conditions, and um, that's the first time we've done it. It's very unpleasant, but it was absolutely necessary. So we do not have those kind of noisy events. It's more catered, it's also, um, um, centered around catering, and very much quoted in all the documentation as well that we received that this is not, it's not noisy, but it's also not even music-centric. Um. I'm going to ask one last question. I wasn't going to, but I am. So, because you just gave an example of guests coming in, making noise, they're told to stop, go home, that's fine. But unfortunately, the noise has already been made, hasn't it? And that's the issue. The issue is one of control. And, and I think the committee is trying to understand actually how you would truly control that noise when it can happen. And once it's done, you might stop it, but it's already happened. That particular night... The generally, I'm speaking, not talking about oh, an sorry. individual event. Well, that, is, that is something that can happen at yeah, any point. In no, time. no, they were stopped, and then they were the next day. I know that was, we, I appreciate they were stopped, but it's happened already. So you've got people coming who you tell, don't make any noise, don't take your stereo outside, and they just do it. So oh, no, it wasn't outside. They, they set something up inside, and also... Um, no, think, but think, basically, there weren't any. They didn't generate noise. It was looking there was going to be a problem. Yeah, it wasn't a. It wasn't a specific question. It was a general Sorry. question. But I think I've got the gist of it. Thank you. Um, I think we, we've got one more speaker, and I'm very aware of time. So thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, if uh, Richard Upton could come forward and speak to. Yeah, councillors, thank, uh, thank you. I think I just need around four minutes. I'm Richard Upton. I'm a local resident. I'm the, also the owner of a, a nearby pub, the Bell in Ticehurst. And the application site is actually between my home and, and that business um, in, in the village. I think the Bell provides equivalent professional and well-managed hoteling and leisure tourism for the benefit of other residents and for the wider economy. The Bell generates over... 1.8 million for the local economy of net economic gain every single year, employs 44 people, many of them from disadvantaged backgrounds. I'm a chartered surveyor. I've restored some 87 listed buildings in my career. I'm also a commissioner of Historic England. Uh, I speak here in a personal capacity. I've known the applicant, uh, John Carter, for many years. I've always found him to be a highly professional businessman, father of two young children and a local family, uh, whenever I've engaged with them at a business level, he's meticulous in managing this important heritage asset. Um, he manages noise levels. We check that because I've heard of some of the complaints, and we take that um, into consideration as well to make sure he's running the operation properly. Um, and he's recently employed staff to ensure quiet at late hours. So I think the, the environmental health evidence is, is pertinent here because um, it seems to support um, the case that John is making to you. There's designated quiet areas, and they're next to uh, neighbours who have very large gardens. And um, as with the bell, um, and we've checked this, he imposes strict conditions on all bookings. And I think that's something that he's learned over the course of the last three years. He needs to be stricter in how he applies those. And from my understanding, he is. And uh, that inspection is from bookings with him. So I think it's intended that those terms and conditions conditions should be referenced in the conditions that your officers put forward and that will help control considerably the intended use and the existing use. I've found John to be a first class professional in all of my business dealings with him. I've experienced Newhouse Farm as a visitor 
and a business client. We've booked many, many um, events, which have been quiet events, never a complaint, and many, many bedrooms over the years. And again, not one complaint about any of those activities. And they're related to the belt, where there's a need for more bedrooms because we don't have enough. Um, I found him to have a strong commitment to running a responsible and neighbourly business, but of course there's some other objectives here that really need to be considered carefully, and I think the officers have done that. Um, in reviewing the officers' report, I think uh, there's much to commend in it. There's, there's clearly evidence, particularly with the environmental health, um, other than the emotion, but I think all things should be taken into account. But a forensic understanding of what actually happens is, is, is necessary, and the officers' recommendation, which I support, is recommending to grant increased controls I think the wider benefits to the community of sustainable rural tourism, as long as it's appropriate, are considerable. And more than ever before, that's essential in rural areas for people from all walks of life to get the opportunity for work, rather than just large homes, perhaps, and large gardens for a few. So, Chair, I mean, I think you said earlier, I think it's important to make decisions within policy uh, and, and, and take your judgments from there. Um, and there are a number of things here that are strongly within policy. In RA2 uh, and 3, five points I'll pick out. You know, does this support local economic and tourism needs? Yes. Does it support the conversion and use of traditional farm buildings? Uh, yes. Does it support rural employment? Yes, it does. Does it support enjoyment of countryside and rural access for others from further afield? Yes, it does. And does it... Uh, accord with local character and I think there are some issues there that are represented in the conditions and controls from your officers landscape character, yes and built heritage, which is a passion of mine yes so I'll finish up, Chair, if I may um, again, I it's a very thorough report from your officers looking into some of the detail the application I think provides some reassurance for some of the issues that have come up and I think Perhaps John and his business has matured over the years and he's learned some mistakes and he needs to listen very carefully today uh, to how this business can uh, become increasingly uh, neighbourly. And I think the, the very strict conditions that can be monitored very carefully by your officers that are suggested in the, in the, uh, the officer's report uh, give you all the controls that you need looking forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we can have some questions if people have questions. Does anyone have a question? Councillor Barnes. I just wanted to clarify one thing. Uh, you speak as a local resident. Can you say which village you actually live in? Yes, I'm in Stonegate. I'm in Battenhurst Road, um, just around the corner. And the, um, sorry, I'm, I'm a, a resident of Rother and the Ticehurst. Uh, this is exactly between the two, business and home. Can you tell me? Um, uh, can you tell me um, how many, or how often, or how many in a year, how many beds have you booked via the bell of, Ooh, of I, Newcastle I, Farm? I wouldn't want to guess and be wildly inaccurate, but the um, the bell, um, as a, a function facility, has 82 weddings this year, um, and uh, and and just has 11 bedrooms. And, and this committee has consented a further seven bedrooms, uh, thank you, um, so that we can increase the success of the pub and the, the economic advantage it gives to the village. And, and can you give us a rough area. idea? Well, I'd guess it would be somewhere between 30 and 40. I'd need to check with my records. I can right. do that quite readily. Sadly, I'm bound to uh, let to Councillor Kirby Green ask a question because... She picked up on the fact that I did the same for Kevin Dixon. Thank you, Jack. I shall, I shall no um, doubt regret that decision. Yes. Um, in your email comments online, um, you state that a new house farm is not a noisy business, and the comments made by objectors are unbelievable. Um, how do you know this? Have you ever spoken to any of the neighbours? Does you yourself admit that you live in Stonegate? You've got a business in Ticehurst High Street, which isn't in a valley, so it's not comparable. Um, so could you let me know how, why you think those comments are unbelievable? They're unbelievable to me. It's a personal comment in a, in a personal email. I've found the, um, and, and that's the capacity with them which I speak. I mean, we have events two or three times a week in the Bell um, with residential properties within five or six metres. Um, and that, the management of that amount of people and traffic and uh, and, and, you know, people coming in from London and elsewhere to celebrate various events is obviously a really sensitive thing. Um, and yet we have 
Um, we have considerably fewer complaints than John does. So I think, you know, we, we make sure that we're not associated with a business that, that has issues. And I think John has admitted himself um, that the business has changed and he's learned some lessons. And I think your officers are saying here, well, let's put appropriate planning controls in place. Your environmental health have reviewed these issues and, and not seen the, the level of objection that's here. And I think Mr Carter, John... He needs to listen carefully to those objections because they're sort of very real to them. And I'm not undermining you know, anyone's complaints about the operation or noise or issues that they've had. I think um, uh, they need to be considered. I think the planning officers have considered them in the very strict controls and strong controls and the evaluation by environmental health gives the local authority the controls they want. And I think at a personal level, John will need to provide... Uh, evidence and proof that he's capable of working with those conditions over a period of time. He needs to do that. And, 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 and from what he said, he's committed to doing that. But, Johnny. Very quick question. Yeah, um, it, it, it was interesting what you said, because you said you spoke in a uh, personal capacity. Um, if I'm correct, your statement that you submitted to Rother said that you were on the historic, uh, I can't read, England, your historic England commissioner. And you actually signed it off as Richard Upton. Historic England Commissioner. So could you confirm, do you speak in a personal capacity that, or do you speak yeah. as a Historic England Commissioner? But it also said lots of other things underneath that. Um, uh, I have a number of roles, but the, that's just the template at the bottom of my email. I'm here because that's the template at the bottom of my email. The, right. um, I'm, I think we I'm can, here. I think we it could be suggested that that was sort of undue influence on me. Um, officers, I would suggest oh, writing in that. No, capacity. no, not at all. I, I think we can accept it's, it's, here in a personal capacity. It's to give but, you a sense that yeah. I am very bothered about the economic productivity of heritage yeah, I assets. Think, I think we understand the position you're coming from, so that, that's fine. Uh, Councillor Prochak. Thank you, and thank you for coming along today. We really do need entrepreneurs like you in our rural areas who actually invest in the economy in the rural areas. So it is it's some reassuring that you actually have got confidence in the applicant. Um, maybe we can't do this as a planning committee, but clearly um, there are bridge building. There's bridge building to do here. Um, we want to support a rural business, definitely, I'm sure. But in this position, it is a very sensitive area, as you know. And I just... Think of all the people on the, on the, uh, who live along that ridge. What a fantastic position they live in. Is there a question? Yes, I wanted to know, is it possible for you to actually help in the bridge building between these residents and, and the business? Um, I don't know how it would be done through regular meetings, or, but I, I look to you. You've got ideas. Look, um Councillor, I think you make a very good point. Um, you, one needs, firstly, to regularise uh, things so there's the proper controls and systems that, with the proper conditions. I take the point, somebody said earlier, that the original conditions were perhaps just not, not strong enough and not defined enough. And I think officers and the council have, have taken this opportunity to, to, to put those in place. I think a watching brief, almost counselling and working these things through... Uh, is, a, is a very sensible idea, and it would make sense for both uh, John and the you know, sustainable use of this building and for the residents, that it clearly needs to de-escalate. And I only made the point about having inspected myself the terms and conditions and how he lets the rooms, because through the bell we buy them, or you know people coming to the bell will buy them, because I would want to check that those are in place and there is proper order in place. Obviously you can't account for everybody who might do something late at night and those are issues and so that needs to be worked through together and perhaps there's a less enforceable but most relevant condition or suggestion that can be made about a regular conversation between neighbours and uh, to manage some of these issues better than they've been managed over the last few years. Thank you very much. I, we really very much appreciate you coming and speaking and uh, you said some really useful things which I'm sure we'll all keep in our minds now and for the future and should take the opportunity to thank you for having a, a very good business within the, uh, the district as well. So thank you for that and we're going to move on. I'm just going to ask uh, Councillor Kirby Green to... to uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, firstly, I have to say I, I find the applicant's statement extraordinary. Um, I think maybe 
I'm living in a different parallel, or I'm living in a parallel universe to the one in which he lives. Um, after the boundary changes implemented in 2019, Etchingham became part of my ward. Within weeks of, weeks of my re-election, I was asked to meet with residents of Sheep Street Lane, where I was brought up to date with the goings-on at Newhouse Farm. I have to say, after seeing some of the evidence, I was shocked that events such as these were taking place. If you don't live in Sheep Street Lane, you would have no idea. Growing up locally, I was very much aware of what a beautiful, untouched lane this was, running alongside the most tranquil valley. And this has remained to this day, with the exception of Newhouse Farm. I regret to say that the activity that I was shown evidence of has continued until the present day. It is as a result of raising these ongoing concerns with enforcement that you are now here today to consider this planning application. Now, I understand the argument from officers is that we should allow this application, which will include tighter conditions, which until this point have not been in place, which will then allow enforcement to take place. It is quite clear by taking a brief look at the New House Farm website and associated social media that conditions have been regularly breached. To be fair, the applicant is not keeping the activities under wraps. In fact, he's positively shouting out about them, using them as a marketing tool to, fo to hold further breaches of conditions. In the heritage statement, New House Farm is described as being isolated. This is clearly inaccurate. As you will have seen when on the site visit, the location of Newhouse Farm is immediately adjacent to the grain store. The two properties showing the same narrow, single-track drive. The grain store is metres away from the swimming pool. There are other properties close by as the crow flies on Sheep Street Lane. When approval was given for the creation of seven holiday lets, there were concerns from both Rother District Council and Etchingham Parish Council that it could result in harm to the setting in the OMB. However, the applicant's consultant at the time wrote in a letter, we can confirm that the converted buildings would be used solely for holiday lets, that the use of part of the barn would be by residents only, and that the type of activity in the barn would not be an events-based activity. We now know, of course, that the seventh holiday let was never turned into a holiday let, and was turned into a kitchen and communal dining hall, which is clearly at odds with the previous quote from the applicant's consultant. Now, the applicant has stated in his reason for the proposal that the business is not sustainable if it operates just as a venue for couples and families seeking to spend a few days at a holiday cottage. I find that statement incredible. There are numerous cottage cluster-type businesses across the country, which, after cursory search online, one can see are now fully booked for pretty much all of 2022. None of these businesses create havoc for neighbours, as they are hosting families who are wanting to have an enjoyable holiday. If Newhouse Farm was operating in the way that was initially envisaged, neighbours would not have a problem. As it is, residents up to two-thirds of a mile away are now subjected to drunken shrieking, swearing, streams of traffic, taxis knocking on the door in the middle of the night, catering vans arriving, parking on Sheep Street Lane, entertainment supplies delivering, coaches dropping people off in Sheep Street Lane, and noisy groups trundling their luggage up and down the track. It is clearly not an appropriate site for this sort of business. Moving to parking, putting aside that I cannot possibly see how 19 spaces have been identified, the telling paragraph is 8.6.3, which states, parking outside the application site is not a matter within the council's control, and as such it could not enforce a condition that precludes parking elsewhere. Parking on a private access road is a civil matter. I think we can all read into that that the residents of the grain store are going to continue having people parking across their access and that they will have to resort to civil action which, as we all know, is lengthy and expensive. I find this unacceptable. The report suggests that there are 15 letters of support. However, I point out that none of these are from people who live in Sheep Street Lane. None of the people supporting this are actually affected by the activities taking place. The provision of extra bathrooms in the main house and the statement in the application form that the Kershaw's listed building should be used by resident guests of the holiday lets and occupants and guests at Newhouse Farm indicates that the main home is not a private home anymore and is operating as a hotel. You are being asked to approve an events-type business with a hotel in one of the most beautiful valleys in the Highwood AOMB. There are nightingales, barn owls, and numerous public footpaths which people use to appreciate the tranquil nature of the area. Be under no illusion the noise pollution happening at the moment, while worst at night, does occur during the day as well. It is quite clear that this untouched location, which has not been subject to development given its important position in the Highwood AOMB, 
is not suitable for the suggested business. It is not Ticehurst High Street. I would urge the committee to reject the application for the following reasons. Firstly, the adverse impact on the beauty and integrity of the High Road AOMB. This has been re-emphasised in the new MP NPPF 2021. It remains in the core strategy. The holiday let provision can be found in the DASA 2019, which states that holiday accommodation must safeguard the intrinsic and distinctive landscape, characters and amenities, paying particular regard to the conservation of the High Road AOMB and not unreasonably harm amenities of residents in the nearby dwellings. Secondly, the damage to the dark skies of the area and the intrusive noise. Noise is a particular reason for objection. You want me to wrap up? Okay, final thing is... Um, we'll crack on. Um, so in the MPMPF, it specifically states that it must identify and protect tranquil areas which have remained relatively undisturbed by noise and are prized for their recreational and amenity value for the reason. And that's what I think is the key thing here. This is a tranquil area. It has remained relatively undisturbed by noise and it is prized for its recreational and amenity value. And I think that's the reason. So there are reasons to turn this down. And finally, the people living in the grain store, I don't think they should be subjected to the horrendous impact on their day-to-day -day life which you don't realise unless you live there. You really don't. It's very easy for people to glibly say it doesn't happen. It does. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Councillor Barnes can start. He's also the, the joint ward member. I think just before starting, though, I think just keep in the mind what the purpose of the recommendation is. The purpose of the recommendation is to create a situation of control that can be enforcement can work against and the situation that exists now is one where there, is, there are no conditions, or there's only one condition, I think, giving the enforcement very little scope to actually enforce. And the problem that is, uh, that is said to exist uh, potentially will continue to exist because we are all aware of the lengthy process of enforcement, even when you can demonstrate an, you know, an enforceable issue it can be appealed, it can go on for a long time. So that's, that's why the officers are saying what they're saying. Clearly, it's the choice of the committee as to how, you know, how this goes forward or whether you want to discuss other conditions or whether you want to talk about uh, temporary permission and so forth and, uh, and hope that uh, Mr Upton supports Mr Carter in, in achieving the objectives because clearly he, his business has some reliance on that as well. I think that is worthy of taking into consideration. So uh, I just thought I'd just put those things in perspective. You know, what, what is the objective here? Uh, Councillor Barnes. Yes, I will make a contribution later as uh, a member of this committee. Uh, but I think I ought to, as ward member, uh, just report on the experience um, that I have had and the Etchingham Parish Council has had. And let me say at once that I, I think Mr. Carter's intentions are always honourable. Uh, I think part of the problem is that what is a laudable intention of actually bringing people into the area for quiet activities is all too frequently breached. And over the years, the Etchingham Parish Council, and I'm privy, obviously, to their discussions as chairman, even if I take no part in their planning discussions, we've had representations from residents. We've heard Mr. Carter twice. We supported the original planning application. We believe holiday lets are a business that is perfectly compatible uh, with a tranquil local area. Indeed, we hope very much that that will bring people in who want to walk and enjoy nature. But what we had from a very early stage was a business that was no longer a holiday let business. It became an events business. And the sort of events that take place, some of which I've seen on videos from time to time, fire-eating, bouncy castles, 
uh, firework displays. Now, these are unpredictable. I can accept there have been quiet events, uh, the kind of events uh, that actually do work for the area. Uh, but at the end of the day, there is a running substratum of complaint from a wide area. This is not just Sheep Street Lane. We all know noise is a very curious thing. Uh, it appears to run along the ridge, although we live about, I would think, 800 yards uh, from uh, Newhouse Farm, because it's on the other side of the ridge and we are right down in the Linden Valley, we don't hear anything. But on the other hand, if you go across to Etchingham Village, and again, I know this from uh, complaints that reached me as a ward member, Parsonage Croft, on the other side of the valley, um, I think there are 25 houses there, uh, do actually get noise uh, from this site. And the other thing I think we really want to bring out as a parish council is just the importance of this particular stretch of the high wheeled. And I will say more about this as, uh, as a contributor to the planning. But if you look at the landscape assessment produced by the county council, they specifically identify this stretch of the rather by name as an extremely important, tranquil valley. And we, all along the way, have resisted. When we had Parsonage Croft built, we specifically said that the houses were not to break the edge of the valley or intrude on the valley. Throughout the years, there are very few houses in the valley itself. Most of them are just off Sheep Street Lane. There are about three or four of them. None of them are well down the slope. Uh, in the valley itself, absolutely no houses. There's one by the old armworks, Forge Cottage. That's the only house in that whole stretch of valley. Um, it then runs down to Roberts Ridge. There are one or two more houses there. But basically, again, between Burwash and Roberts Ridge, you have a totally unspoilt uh, part of the high wheeled. And you yourselves attended a site meeting. Did you listen to the ambient noise level? Uh, you could, the silence is palpable. And that's why people come and walk there. On the footpaths, on the circuit of road that goes round. People come to enjoy nature, to listen to the nightingales at night, uh, to actually appreciate the tranquility and the silence and the spiritual refreshment you get from a valley. The businesses in the valley need to be compatible with that. And that is why I would remind the planning committee that they have put quite strong restrictions on King John's Lodge, uh, the garden centre just along the lane, Sheep Street, uh, precisely because we recognize that a quiet business is compatible with the area, but anything that is noisy is not compatible with the tranquility of that valley. And that is the view that the locals would want me to express. I'm sympathetic to what Mr. Carter desires to do, but I have to say his practice has so far let us down rather badly. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Barnes. I, I, I want to ask a question of uh, the, the officer, uh, Sarah. Um, the application doesn't actually refer to events. It refers to the, the change of mixed use for the, um, and uh, the use of the barn, etc. Is there any reason why we wouldn't restrict this to, to, to uh, not include events, group events of any kind? In other words, so it acts as the holiday let business that it was intended to act as, because there are plenty of groups of, I think as uh, Councillor Kirby Green said, groups of 
holiday lets of six and seven houses that, that seem to operate very profitably and effectively. And I mean, I know not that far from where I am in the Powder Mill Reservoir, there's a group of, I'm not sure if it's six or eight, and uh, they act very tranquilly. I mean, it's a beautiful area next to the reservoir, and they're, from what I can understand, a profitable business, yeah, and popular. Is that? Yes, sir, Chair. Chairman, the uh, application is actually, you know, as in the description for change of use of the dwelling and land. Um, and it's when you look at the individual, the written schedule of information that's with the application that it sets out the, the, I, the view, the events that occur, such as the yoga retreats and the business training and team building. They're identified in that and you have the plan that's got the... Um, uses of various external areas on it. Are they not sort of applying for use as an event site? That's what I'm trying to get to. They're applying for certain other activities, external activities, yes, and that's what we're saying at the moment. You haven't got any controls on those ac external activities. The only control that there is at the moment is on the use of the barn because the previous application didn't envisage use of external areas and that's the, the elements that have raised issues particularly and that's the areas that we've been looking at and hence we've got the plan that specifies areas and hence the conditions that we were looking at. But can at it be approved without events? Zones. But that's... But that's a question. That's, can it be approved without events? If that's something that you wanted to consider, well, then that could yeah. be precluded. You know, just, yeah, just wanted to ask the yeah. question. Yeah, I mean, we've already put the condition on about no um, non-residents visiting the site. Yeah. Um, so, yes, if you wanted to tighten up and just return to, you know, people that are resident, uh, the holiday oh, lets right. just and not having retreats or other activities like the team building and business activities, then that is something that for you to consider, yes. Uh, Councillor Maidley. No, thank you, Chairman. Um, and I speak as being, having had 20 years experience in the events business, um, particularly from organising weddings on behalf of other people, and that's back here in Bexhill. Whilst we holding the events, particularly weddings, um, because by the nature of them, they are noisy, um, we can control them leaving our premises because we don't sleep any of them. It's only a function room. But we have no control once they've moved away from us to wherever they are spending the night or particularly in a, in a, a, a situation like this, we're going back in a group and a gang all turning up at probably mainly after midnight down a track, headlights, noise generally, excitement, um, it's impossible, and they never, ever seem to do it very quietly. So that is my comment from my experience of me in the past. Thank you. Do I have anyone else that would like to ask? Yes, Councillor Langlands. Yes, um, uh, I find myself between a rock and a hard place here, really, <laughs> because it's, you know, a question of approval and stricter conditions, but we haven't by the conditions that were set in the first place. So I, I'm sort of, and, and I can't see anywhere that we've ever done any enforcement, have we? No. That's just a question. No. No, no enforcement. No. Can, shall I reply on yeah. that? There is only one condition at the moment in respect of use of the barn. And that does say that it should only be used by the occupiers of the holiday lets and not any residents or even the owner of um, the dwelling. And so that is the only condition that's on there. Um, and while we're aware that there have been occasions when they've had other activities in there by people in the dwelling, you know, they're occasional and there's not sufficient evidence to pursue a breach of that condition notice for those odd incidents. The other incidents that are going on have been external activities and we don't have any conditions or anything at the moment in respect of any external uses, external music, whatever, because that wasn't part of the previous considerations and there aren't any conditions that control those. Miles Joyce would like to say something. I've got Miles Joyce. Miles, would you like to 
Come on screen, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, just to say, just uh, refer you to Condition 8, which does prohibit weddings, wedding receptions, um, as on site. That, Miles, I think, I think the comment was more in relation to noise around uh, No, I understand that, um, but I would also like to add that, you know, we, there are... You know, the, there are several restrictive conditions here. And to also say, you know, I know there's complaints about lack of enforcement action, but that doesn't mean that enforcement is not being, you know, there's not enforcement investigations are ongoing. Um, it is quite legitimate to put in an application just to remind people of that, to try and regularize it. And the additional conditions attached are looking to overcome and give the option of enforcement action. Enforcement action, of course, is our discretion. But as Sarah rightly says, at the moment, um, we have very little scope to enforce. So I just make those points. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Prochak. I think that's the big question that Miles has, has touched on is um, although, although um, I forgot sorry it, it was raised that some of the conditions are perhaps not adequate and I just wonder I need an answer that these conditions are enforceable I think that's that's the big question and would it be stronger if we said give temporary permission for two years say to see how the applicant okay <laughs> I'll take that back. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Langlands. Sorry, I did have another question to ask, if that's okay. When we did a site visit, Sarah, we did look at this awful plastic boundary mm -hmm. that was, I think, meant to be something to do with noise reduction for the neighbours, which was appalling. Is it acceptable in the terms of it's within the curtilage of a listed building and secondly, uh, could we possibly make a condition that that boundary is, is improved somewhat to try and protect the noise level from next door? I have actually, um, I did ask the applicant about it as well, because obviously, as you'll be aware, planning permission is required for a new boundary within the curtilage of a listed building. Um, the applicant was trialling a temporary measure to see if it would assist. Um, I have spoken to environmental health and, and it's not of a sort of construction that is likely to be acceptable to them in terms of noise mitigation, but there could potentially be other um, boundary treatments that could be considered in terms of noise mitigation. So that's something that you could be considered and you could put a condition on about that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm struggling to to consider granting this. I know there's conditions, but they didn't keep to the other conditions. So it was let out to have six little holiday lets, choir that families would go to. You could quite clearly see that the children's area wasn't used. I mean, they're not using it for family use. They're using it for parties. And it was evidence of that with the videos. I'm, I'm really finding this hard to grant this at all. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Barnes. Yes, I th the problem is we're also looking at this as if it were a nighttime noise. But the daytime levels that attract people to the area to walk, uh, again, are broken by an events business. Uh, we know there is what's called the Lombard effect. If you have any background noise, People raise their voice to speak over it, and the levels very quickly get to DBA uh, 76. Occasionally, even in London restaurants, they exceed DBA 80. Uh, we have, and I look to the guide to buildings, we talk about the wall gardens, zone C. These are for guests to enjoy, and inside is a barbecue area, fire pit, and picnic tables for guests. In good weather, there has been music played in here of a level that causes no noise interference. But background music, then conversation, up go your levels. Um, 
business courses can be quiet, um, but equally, you, you know that those two can become physical activities that tend to be strenuous and quite noisy. The difficulty is really finding a set of conditions which would effectively restrict this to being a quiet business. If it was simply all about monastic retreats uh, or Buddhists, uh, which, to be honest, I think the owner would prefer, uh, nobody would have any objection. But the problem is, in an area of general tranquility, to have an events-based business is to tolerate something which is totally out of keeping with the character and tranquility of one of the outstanding valleys in the high-wheeled AOMB. The two simply don't sit easily together. And I think you have to put the wider interest of the community ahead of the narrow interest of the businessman. I, I, I'm sorry. The other thing I do want to just say, because it is quite important, is the owner of Newhouse Farm owns the land running down to the valley. He does not own the old farmyard to the west or the grange to the east. And therefore, the curtilage in which you can actually park cars is very limited. He speaks of 19 car spaces. Frankly, I stood there and tried to work out how you actually got as many as 19 in. But if, of course, the parking spills over onto the track, it gets in the way of the commercial activities in the farmyard to the west and impinges on that owner, or it impinges on the owners of the Grange to the right. And so, partly because of the pattern of ownership that has developed historically, you really do not want cars spinning over into a track that serves a legitimate business activity or a, a private owner. And so it seems to me parking itself is a major problem which is not properly addressed in what we've got. Final point, um, if we are minded to do anything, do remember that environmental health back in 2021, I think, did say to us we should do a noise survey first and an ambient noise level before we did anything. And so that should be our first step, even if we have to defer the application. Uh, Councillor Gray. Thank you, Chair. Just a very quick question. If we don't approve this, where does that leave us? Does it mean that there's no conditions at all that he carries on as he is? That is the issue at hand, but there is the alternative of, if you like, because of what had happened over time, the, the, uh, the applicant has given many um, assurances, but maybe it just needs to be recalibrated back to holiday lets with a temporary permission, with all the conditions, but no events, just to see how he gets on, because clearly there is demand for his houses for, for accommodation, as set out by Mr Upton, and that's a good thing. We wouldn't want to restrict that. Um, so maybe this is, the, this is the point of actually putting, it, putting all the conditions in but no events and maybe some others around the pool because of the proximity to the direct neighbours and so forth and see how he gets on, really. I mean, if, see how he fulfills the commitments that he's, he's making. That, that, is, that I see, is a, a, valid, you know, a valid option uh, because you, we, clearly there is a need for conditioning here um, to... Um, to, to for enforcement to take action against should a problem occur. Um, I've got Miles Joyce on. Miles. i just say it was, uh, it, it was tentatively suggested um, by one of the committee, but there is an option also of temporary planning permission. It can be conditioned to be for a temporary period. Uh, thank you, Miles. Uh, yes, Councillor Errington. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I appreciate this is going on a long time. Um, 
the barn is a bit of a, a white elephant. It, it, it's got to wash its face from a business perspective, and I know that's not a planning issue. But going back to the the 2015 commission, is that now out, that'll be out of time, won't it? So he can't. If that were to be made into the seventh let again, that would then replace some of the income, which is obviously he's getting from these other events, because. I can't. I don't want to walk away from here today without putting some conditions on because it's just going to be the same, if not worse. But so, can we condition it that there are no events and maybe encourage the applicant to look again at that 2015 application to make the barn a seventh let so that it does actually increase the holiday lets? I'll just say that the seventh holiday let does not take up the whole barn. It's only that end section um, up to sort of where the pool, the little snooker table thing was. It's that end section there that's the seventh unit and the rest of the barn which was still to be used as a communal area for, for occupiers of the holiday lets. So it doesn't remove the barn from use by other of the residents of the site. Just slightly to add to what Sarah said as a communal quiet area. Specific words were in the condition. Well, I think Councillor Stevens is next. I'll take you in a minute. Um, two things, really. One, the barn. I mean, that seventh room should have been put in. That was a break of the condition. Also, if you change this house, where's all the parking going? All these extra rooms. Where are they going to park? Uh, Councillor Norton. I, uh, I agree with Jeanette and, and John, and I think Sarah, I think we should expressly exclude events. Um, I hadn't visited this beautiful valley until yesterday, but I was, I was so impressed, I was profoundly moved by the quality of the, not just the scenery, but the quality of the piece. I don't know when I've experienced silence like that before. Mm -hmm. And that is a very rare and precious thing, and I think it should take precedence, preservation of that, take precedence over any other consideration, frankly. Mary Barnes, I think, last question will put forward some sort of proposal, then you can... Thank you, Chairman. Um, from what we're hearing from those who have um, suffered noise and disturbance at night, could we put on some sort of restriction about vehicle movements after a certain time? Because that would stop people arriving or being collected after a certain time. I mean, one o'clock in the morning is not funny if you're being woken up, um, particularly after a lot of noise. If you take events out, a lot, a lot of that will disappear. Uh, but we can ask Sarah, is there a... Is that... In one of the conditions actually refers to the use of the site for residents only and to exclude anybody yeah. coming. Yeah. But having said that, if, for instance, somebody has got a function at the Bell and they're staying at this yeah. site, yeah. We, that's unreasonable for, for us yeah. to say that you can't, do, you know, it's an existing dwelling. You shouldn't be putting on a restriction that an existing householder, you know, would impact them as well. Yeah. Okay. That's too mm. long. Did you want to say something? Did you want to say something more, John? Are you sort of... Now, now. Give you the Tony Gowley Award in the middle. I think the only thing I would want to say as local member oh. is I, I do think BNB uh, do impose their own restrictions. So if you actually forbade events, uh, you probably would actually find that BNB might well uh, exercise their own control over the bed and breakfast business, which is the one which principally concerns our officers. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Maley, let's, let's try and get that to a proposal. Oh, sorry, thank you, Chairman. Uh, no, I was going to comment on the, the sort of outside, because I wanted to, to qualify something I, I said in case it was mis, mis, misrepresented. Um, Mr. Upson's point about people staying there um, who'd come from an, another a wedding at the pub, not a wedding on site. Um, but I guess the, the, the late-night noise could be taken into account by people generally returning late and it could be monitored. Well, it's a holiday let now anyway. I think people can come and go as they, they, they choose now. 
but one would imagine if they're just individual cars, then it's not going to be the same as buses or you know, people leaving the venue, if you like. Uh, well, I'm going to suggest something. I don't know if anyone wants to propose it. I can propose it if you want to. I'm going to, I'm going to suggest that, uh, that we approve this with the following changes, and you may want to, to dismiss them or add to them, that, um, that it is that the conditions be changed to remove all events. Um, it be a temporary permission. I'm going to say a year. You might want to change that. Uh, and that the one area that concerned me was control on the pool, so there should be a limited number of people allowed in the pool area with no games and perhaps a restriction finishing at 6 o'clock at night or something like that. Um, Anyone want to make comments comments on, on those points? They sound too... I know you're trying to wind it up quite rightly, uh, but do we have a definition of an event? Uh, Sarah? The schedule of information is quite specific in the activities, which include the yoga retreats and the business uses um, for training and team building exercises. Uh, you know, it, it doesn't reference any other events. Well, I think all events. Yeah, so it would, it would effectively become what it was originally approved for, a holiday-let um, business, yeah. I mean, what happened was it was given approval for that and it evolved into something else. And that's the, the issue that we're dealing with here what it's evolved into, because nobody was unhappy with the holiday list, were they? Or the people who were here making that decision. Councillor Barnes. Yeah, okay. Can I just clarify that? Because if, say, two or three couples get together to, to take units so that they can celebrate a birthday, is that an event? An event organised by the owners, is it? I appreciate there needs to be a definition of events. <laughs> Councillor Langland, then I'll ask Councillor Kirby Green just to finish up with something. Okay, Councillor Kirby Green, do you just want to sort of finish up? And I would like to finish up, but I'd like to ask a question. I believe that there is a no event condition at the moment. There are a number of no, specified. No, no, events. in the existing permission from 2016 15, I believe there's a no event condition. All right. Condition on there at the moment precludes use of the barn for um, ceremony, wedding ceremonies and hen and stag parties and that sort of thing and restricts it to use by residents of the holiday lets only as a, a communal meeting area. I just go and make a couple of points, please. So first of all, there, we've, we've talked about the fact that we can't enforce at the moment. We can this is your final speech. Yes, yeah, we can enforce at the moment, but enforcement action was put on hold, allowing the applicant to resubmit an application to regularise everything. As you will all be aware, that's the, that is the approach to enforcement at the moment. So to say we can't enforce at the moment is not true. We have loads of evidence that they have been using the long barn as an event, so they are breaching conditions. They haven't converted the seventh holiday let. That is a breach of conditions. They could be enforced. That's, so not just breach, that's not a breach of condition. They just haven't no, yeah, carried out no, the No, no, but they, the put a, they put a kitchen and a, and a sort of party room in. So the point I'm making is that I think I just want to just make sure that members know that it's not a question of let's leave it as it is and everything continues. If we left it as is, you could, I would be tomorrow speaking to Mark Wright saying, right, now we need to enforce because everything was put on hold for this application. So I just want to make that clear. And the final thing, Jonathan, I entirely agree with you about the holiday lets business, what you said at the beginning. But the whole point here is the applicant's written in his application that that isn't viable. And that's why he's asking for events. So I don't... So, no one is in disagreement. No he, one he hasn't, he hasn't that, presented any viability um, no. information, so I think you, know, you, just you can't really make a judgment on that. It's but I think it statement. suggests that the applicant doesn't want to run it as a holiday let business, that's what I'm saying. He may not, but that's what he's got permission for. Councillor Langlands. I've got can miles I, as can well. I just ask if we can adjourn for a bit, just to uh, just to get some clarity on some of these things, especially the proposals that we might consider making. 
don't think we need to do that. I've got Miles, but if you want to ask Felicity a question on, on this, then that's fine. Uh, Miles, you, you want to say something, and I just think we should round it up then. I think we've got enough information. Yeah, okay. I mean, I think you've got this as it is. We can't then have something which adds extra conditions to something as it is. So we have to be very careful about that, firstly. Secondly, you're proposing, I think, sensibly, in my view, my humble opinion, temporary planning permission. Um, whether for a year or slightly longer, that's something um, to to consider. Um, but as Sarah says, there is a schedule of activities which is quite clear what they want to do. And I just wonder if you're going to grant temporary permission, whether um, that condition could be worded to limit it to those scheduled events. Bear in mind the other restrictive conditions that are already down in, uh, for recommendation in the officer's report. And um, I'd be interested to actually know what Felicity thought about that as well, because um, I think I'll begin to, you know, something which is a workable um, proposal, uh, which strikes the balance between um, being rightly restrictive and not being so restrictive it's unreasonable. And I mean by re unreasonable, I mean in planning terms. I think we want it to operate as, a, as you know, in the intention of the original application, but with, with sufficient controls to actually stop the expansion, which has caused the issue. And so that's, uh, I think, Felicity, if you could, if you could, if you could not make any noise, please. <laughs> uh, no, no, John, Felicity's just going to um, respond to that, and then if you could ask a question. Felicity. I'm so sorry. I've, uh, I've, I'm, it, not entirely sure what I'm being asked. I think it's about uh, whether we can do this no events condition. Correct. So, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, John. <laughs> oh, oh, one word answer, just to say. Uh, and, and you, glad you got, we can do no events. You, you got the answer of the day award for I, this. I, thank you. I, I'm glad we can do no events, but uh, I do have a slight problem in trying to define what happens if a group of residents in the holiday lets want to get together. Okay. So I, it, it may be better... Uh, sorry, I was going to make a yes. yeah, yeah, It might be better to uh, say what kind of events... But the one that really we do need to enforce is no amplified music whatsoever. If we're sort of, that's already in there. That, that's already a condition. Yeah, but that it? needs to be enforced. I personally think uh, that no events would be a very good one, but I think we do have to define very carefully so what, what an I'm, event is. What I would suggest is to overcome that, because I don't think we could have a, probably have hours of debate on what an event is, is that if you want to go with that proposal, take a vote on it if you want to, um, that uh, we delegate it to officers to come forward with a reasonable definition of what isn't or isn't particularly given that a group, a group of families could come together and, and um, seemingly as individuals but really as an event. So I know that there's going to be a, there will be a grey areas here, but I think giving that to the officers to figure that one out is probably better than trying to have an hour's discussion on what, what events are and aren't and who can and can't because I think that's possibly nearly impossible. Um, so, well, no, I just just delegate it, and we can we can have a discussion before it goes into a decision. Yeah. Okay, so I'll put a proposal up. See if you like it. <laughs> Make it easy. So the proposal is. Um, if you look back at Greg's original letter, he did suggest doing a noise survey as a precursor to defining conditions. I think that would be a useful first step. I don't think there's a, I don't think there's a, a need to do a survey because it, the environmental health will do surveys when there is a problem, not not in advance of a problem, if you know what I mean. You can't. Yeah, please, Sarah. On that. Um, you want I mean, to do I it in advance because of the ambient noise point. And he, what I want to bring out is just how low the ambient noise is. 
Right. Environmental Health have suggested no amplified music in the external areas, and they've suggested the limit in respect of any noise coming out of the barn, their conditions five and six. They have not got, you know, the, the staffing and the means and the resources to go around doing noise testing all the time. Okay. We know that it's a tranquil area, and hence the wording of the condition that Environmental Health have provided. Okay, uh, Councillor Errington, his final comment, I'm going to put it forward a proposal. You can it's, vote on that, or, or second it or not, as you like. It's only a small thing, but you said about the pool being shut at six o'clock. I think I'd rather go with the eight o'clock, which was um, in the original conditions, because if we are trying to, Mr Carter is trying to run it as a business, it is supposed to be fun, and when you're on holiday, you might want to go in the pool after six o'clock. And would you recommend how many people might be in the pool area at one time? Six or the a family or no more, you know, depending on the size of the family. Four six. Thank you. Okay. Here's the proposal. The pro proposal is to that, that uh, it be approved with the exclusion of any events. Events. The, the definition of the events to be delegated to officers. I'm happy to have a look at that with somebody else to see that we're all in agreement that, with that. With the addition that the pool be restricted to six people at any one time and not to be used after eight o'clock at night. I think I've got everything that, that, that was in my mind. Uh, length of? Oh, and temporarily for one year? You're saying two years? You're saying one year? Well, let's, let's try it with one and see what happens, yeah? There seems to be a lot of ones coming around the room. Okay, so that's a pro... Does any... Sorry, Councillor Prochet. Sorry, I asked another question. That's so right. we're ignoring totally the officer's suggestions of conditions. No, they'll have all the conditions. Okay. They'll have all the conditions, only removing any reference to, or actually removing any events and actually putting in the conditions to say there are no events. So it runs as a holiday. It will be running as a holiday let facility, effectively, and the, the people in the holiday let can use the long barn as their entertainment area or even to eat in there if they want to, whatever. So it's you know it's not underused facility, and they can reapply or for their for their seventh holiday let. Yes, Councillor Mayor. Um, yes, uh, shoot me down if, I, if I've missed something. Um, is there anything to, to stop uh, individuals getting together as a group and book, booking the entire complex in one go? I'm thinking perhaps a rug, rugby club on tour or something of that sort. Should we restrict it to no, no more than four to book together at any one time? I think that's struggling a bit. I think, struggling. I think uh, let's get the de definition of events, and we, those things can be considered, because that's a good point that you raised, you know, I mean, that's sort of a, a backdoor event is what you're saying. Yeah. And, and I think we need to just work out how that is uh, conditioned. So are we, is everyone happy with this? Go on. Another comment about the year is that we're into this season already. Yeah. So does that give enough time to test this? Well, when would you like an end date? You can just give an end date. You don't have to give a, a, a Well, I would say two summer seasons, but I mean, is that fair? Two, two, two months. Or you can give a date. I mean, when would you say it would be an appropriate time to go through a full season? December 2023? Yeah? Okay. Temporary permission to December 2023. No events to be defined, uh, delegated to officers, but we can have a look at that just to see, to make sure there's no obvious backdoor uh, things going through. Pool to be used uh, no later than 8 o'clock with no more than six people at one time. That's a proposal. Just, just the boundary issue we didn't... Oh, and uh, and that the and that and that and that the, the, there be a um, some condition to deal with an acoustic fence and the removal of the the plastic, which is um, not in keeping. Chairman, I'm still worried about the parking issue. I don't think the parking issue will dissipate because it already has permission for those holiday lets. Yeah. So you can't. That's what we're bringing it back to. We're saying run it as the holiday lets which helps Mr Upton as well because he won't lose the accommodation for the bell. Uh, it will be there uh, and for, for the benefit of others, which was the intention. This is an application which is given and it then grew out of that into something else. And what we're saying is just bring it back to that, see how you, make sure that runs properly, you don't make noise, you satisfy the neighbours, you try and build bridges with the neighbours and, uh, and hopefully everyone can be happy uh, and we'll see, see that in December 2023.
Well, they, they can let the house. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no reason why they can't Just do that. Checking. Yeah. So I will propose that. Does anyone want to second it? Okay. Okay. We have a proposer and second of that. All those in favour of that. Okay. Good. Yeah. Those against. Those abstaining. There's one against. Those abstaining. What did you do, John? I didn't catch that. Against. So one against, one abstaining. Two against, sorry. Who was the second against? You were, you were against, but two against. Have we got the correct number? So that is passed with all of those conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you to the uh, uh, members of the public who have attended. Uh, there is a second one for listed. Now, what I'll say is I, th I think it will probably time to have a, a sort of a half-hour lunch break. Is that what you would like to do? There is the listed building application. I don't know... Maybe the people who spoke now, do you want to just indicate whether you want to speak again for the listed? Well, okay, you can. You, you can do that. And Mr. Carter and Mr. Upton, did you want to speak for the list, listed building? Oh, he has too, sorry. Okay, all right. Um, well, okay, well, we do have to um, have a bit of a break for people. Uh, so is that going to cause you a problem? I'm happy to, in that you are listed to speak. It has taken a while. Uh, I'm, I would be happy to ask the committee to defer it to give you the opportunity to speak because you have asked to speak. Um, the, on the, the listed building application. Um, it's in line with... Oh, no, no, no. What I'm saying is you, 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 you asked to speak and you can speak, but you, you're, we've run late and out of time, and I'm happy to put to the committee to defer that to, to allow you to speak, because it would be unfair to do otherwise, yeah? All right, well, I'm just going to take a quick thing on that. Um, I'm going to propose that that application is deferred to allow Mr. Um, uh, Carter to come and speak at the next one. Is everyone, could I take a vote on that? Yeah, all those in favour? Uh, that, that, is anyone against that? No, anyone abstaining? That's 100% for that. So that will be heard at the next planning meeting. I apologise for the, the deferral. Uh, I, are you, I should ask, are you happy to give the extension for that to happen? All right, thank you very much. And it will help the other rest of the audience who have waited patiently. On that basis, let's take uh, a half an hour's break, 20 past two, and we'll come back and, and do that. Are you going to have a problem with the climate change meeting? Right, continuation of the Planning Committee, 23rd of June, 2022. The next application is item 11, which is RR2022-289L, stroke which is the uh, shelter number one on the East Parade. Who's got these doing it? <laughs> if you wouldn't mind. Uh, so this is an application for the addition of a replica um, ridge crest to the bandstand roof down on um, Marine Parade. So it's actually restoring um, an, an architectural feature. There's the, the bandstand, which no doubt uh, most of you are familiar with. Uh, there's a, the aerial photograph of it. Um, this is the proposal. So uh, it's been revised since it was initially submitted uh, to inc include some banding and a central motif. And that is a picture of the original um, crest uh, that was on the bandstand. So very similar to what is, uh, the proposal is very similar. There'll be aluminium co 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 <laughs> uh, black, <laughs> uh, coated in black. And it's recommended for approval. It's come before you because it's a council-owned development. Any comments or thoughts? I'm happy to move that we agree with the officer recommendation. Proposer and seconder, can we have a vote? Those in favour? That's unanimously approved. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claire. Item 12 is. RR2022-602-T, Cranston Avenue, Beck Hill. Oh, sorry, this is the RR2022-602-T, 
sorry, 602P, 22 Cranston Avenue, Bexhill. So this is before you today because it's an application submitted by a staff member. It's, as you recall, we went on site. Um, it's for the demolition of an existing garage to the side of the building and replacement with a single story side extension which will be set aside from the side boundary and the front and rear building lines will be in line with that of the main property. This is the existing elevations with the garage shown. And that's the proposed um, elevation as you see with a set away from the boundary uh, recommended for approval. Uh, any thoughts or comments? Uh, recommendation has been moved by Councillor Prochak and seconded by Councillor Gray. Uh, can all those, just say something you the can say something, yeah. Just, just as on. the wall, just as the wall, Councillor, that I'm, I think this is a, an excellent plan. But it, it, we can draw the floor. Thank you, uh, you Councillor Langland, <laughs> for the insightful comment. And uh, those in favour of the recommendation, uh, that's uh, unanimous. Thank you very much. Uh, item 13. Uh, item 13 is RR2022 stroke 497 stroke P number 2 Woodside Pet Road Pet. So this application is before you today because it's a relative of a member of staff. Um, so it's for a single storey uh, outbuilding in the back garden of 2 Woodside Pet Road. This is the plan showing the location. It's a part of a pair, a semi-detached property. Um, you'll see there's some planting, it's going to be some screening, and the outbuilding is shown along the boundary. You'll see it sits next to the boundary with the neighbouring property. The property is, is here, the application site, and the outbuilding will be about here. That's the appearance of the building, the outbuilding. Since the initial submission, revisions have been made to because uh, the land slopes down. So bearing in mind the relationship with the neighbouring property, the proposal's been revised from a pitch roof to a flat roof. That's a picture of, of the back garden. As you'll see, there's some um, screening along the neighbouring garden. and You can just make out they've got a, a greenhouse as well. This photograph here shows you how the, the land slopes downwards. So the proposal involves um, building that up to place the outbuilding. And that's why the uh, proposal's been uh, changed to a flat roof. As revised, um, we don't consider there'll be any impact on the amenity of the neighbouring properties. And overall, we consider it won't be harmful to the uh, character and appearance of the area. So it's a recommendation for approval. Anyone got any comments on that or any thoughts? Yes, Councillor Mia. Yes, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, just the one, one comment, and that's about the proposed uh, external lighting. Uh, could that perhaps be conditioned that um, that should be agreed with officers? Um, I'm thinking of our dark skies policies. Yes, I don't think that will be a problem. You want no external lighting? Is that... Well, unless, unless approved by the officers under okay. the conditions. Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Langland. Did you, did you want something? Uh, yes, just quickly. Will the trees be going then along that boundary? Councillor Barnes. Yes, I, I always uneasy when a building that somebody is putting up uh, goes right up to the boundary of the next door garden. I'm also slightly uneasy uh, about the effect on the countryside of the design of this building. I, I'm not sure I find a flat roof really that acceptable in rural areas. Most of our roofs are pitches. Hmm? Could be a green roof. Ah, well, that would be a slightly different point. But I don't think we've, we've been... Uh, 
I'm, 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 location in design, I'm not in principle against, but I, I have to say I don't find that a particular uh, attractive building. No. Well, you could condition it with a, with a green roof if you wanted to. Or you could refuse it if you don't like it, if you think it's out of character. Any other comments? Yes, Councillor Prochak. Picking up the comment that it's because the applicant is working from home such a lot that they've decided that this would be a help for them, support for them. And, that, and that's a good point. There could be more of these sort of applications for external offices because people are trying to find places to work. Um, yes, Councillor Langlands. Maybe we should think about green roofs then, particularly as part of our sort of environment strategy because it would be really good in terms of biodiversity and things. So could you condition that with a green roof? Can you do that? At the, at the moment, we haven't got any policies that would support that, um, I'm afraid. So. But, and it's not conditionable? It's not something that you could you feel it would be? Uh, no, because if we impose a condition, we have to, to, to link it back to uh, policy. Okay. Councillor Neal? Uh, uh, presumably, the only reason that this is requiring permission is because it's in the AOMB that normally something of this sort would be permitted development. That might be a bit big for permitted development. Yes, yeah, but no, it's, it's the area of outstanding natural beauty that triggers it. Does it have any, any form of solar power? Not that I'm aware of, no. These are good examples of things that, sh that really should be encouraged or included, and one would hope that they, applicants would just figure that one out for themselves. But this would be a perfect example for uh, particularly a flat roof, solar or, or green, to power that building, wouldn't it? Maybe, maybe we could sort of put a note on there that they might consider that as part of their construction. So, yes, we could add a note informative to that effect. But you would have liked to have seen a, either a, a solar roof or a, or a green roof, and if they could include that, if that required further uh, approval, it would be likely to come given that the, the committee has brought that up specifically. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, any other thoughts or comments? Does anyone want to propose that? Okay, proposal. The Prochak and Councillor. Mia has seconded that. Those in favour of that, with that little notation added. And those against? We have one against, and so that's uh, carried, and the notation will be put on uh, accordingly, and with the hope that the applicant might actually do those things, which would be a very positive thing to do, particularly as a home office. Good. That takes us to item 14, which is the appeals. Does anyone have any questions on the appeals? I mean, I know we have a... a the list is longer than usual because we've had more applications. Yeah, Jeanette. Well, that was a delegate. That was a delegated. That. I don't know. That's it's, it's, the, it's the it's the famous land gate, isn't it? It's it's the it was the third one, and it's all to do with keeping out the pigeons. And I, I've been a little bit involved in this. English Heritage have been advising and all sorts of conservation bodies. So I think this is a right to be a very sound development. They're all delegated. It is a delegated one, yeah. Any, any other um, queries or questions? Just for information of members, um, page 84, uh, Bodium, Park Farm Post, Park Farm Lane, Bodium. Um, there is a, another application in from the same applicant for the same application, which is like, probably going to be recommended for approval 
So this this appeal will fall by the wayside, I would think. I think we know that one, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, all right. Uh, Councillor Barnes? I'm not the local member for this one, but I just draw attention on page 86 uh, to Bantam Farm. I hope we're going to fight this hard. This is a guy who keeps coming back. Um, I think we've probably got a 14-year history of applications which broadly are all trying to achieve the same thing. And there must come a point at which we ought to be treating him as a vexatious applicant. Did you want, did you want Miles to comment on that? Miles, are you there? Yes, so I'm here. Um, uh, Councillor Barnes asks whether the applicant for Tysus Bantam Farm, which is a long history of uh, applications for the similar and the same thing, at what point can we treat him or them, or the, <coughs> the applicant, I should say, as... Uh, a vexatious ap applicant or something similar to? Well, you, there is power to decline to determine either if there's an extent enforcement notice or if it's materially the same as a previous submission. It wouldn't necessarily mean we'd automatically apply this, but it is something that we can look at if we feel that someone's just putting in essentially the same applications you know, more than one in a kind of stalling process, and we could decline to determine it. Is there some way to flag those up in the future? This well, I think... This particular applicant is apparently... I think it's when we look at resubmissions, and it's just... It's one of the things to work on um, with validation, that managing the validation and perhaps working with them where there is similar or identical um, applications coming in, um, a free go is one thing. But, um, you know, that is something that we can look at. But I think it's something which isn't part of the culture at the moment. Okay. Now, I would hasten to add, it doesn't stop in these cases if there is a breach formal action being taken. But it is something that we can do. Okay, thank you. So it's about raising that awareness and spotting these. Is it possible um, I wasn't is aware I wasn't aware it was a massive issue, but given the rural overwhelmingly rural nature of um, of rather, it would tend to get more of these kind of applications, I would suggest. Is it possible to flag it with PBS so that if something comes in it doesn't automatically get <laughs> Yes, more but they, as I said, as I explained, um, it's about um, being raising that awareness and it's about being there at the start with validation. Um, to spot this, and that is something which is, um, I think, um, is slightly changing the culture and something to get good at. Okay. Well, if that, if that particular applicant could be noted, and uh, and some, and, and perhaps if you can think of how that flag system can work, <laughs> Councillor Prochet. Well, I, yeah. Sorry. Okay, go on. I was going to say, Miles, we would appreciate feedback on that particular one, the Bantam Farm one, particularly because. That's the one that's always held up as what do enforcement do, what <laughs> yes. do rather do. So that's become the, yeah. the bet noir. Well, we did, we did dispose of a, an application there, and they didn't care for it much, but it was right to dispose of it. It was going nowhere. Um, I mean, ultimately, yeah, I mean, like so many things, um, you know, there's a lot to do here, and, you know, we have tools and it's about sharpening those tools to get good at doing certain things we perhaps didn't do in the past. Can I ask you a question at this point which is slightly off appeals? Do you know what the updated situation is with Hodes Farm where you seem to be receiving reports of continued activity at night time and weekends and so forth? You, I know I hit you with that without warning and I apologise. You probably yeah, answer it. Pro yeah I, I mean with that one I was just chatting to Dan Bevan about that and um, it seems to be some uh, alleged uh, spray painting or something going on. Now, y you know as well as I do that the conditions on one of them and one of them is a prior approval and, and you know what the situation is, not least the complainant perhaps doing something you shouldn't be doing. So there's a whole, there's a whole host of things going on there, but how much we can actually do is rather more open to question. 
So we are doing what we can do there, and it is under investigation. But it is one of these sites that's it's just going to run on. It's that kind of site, and we can't do an awful lot about that. All right, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, Mary Barnes. Yes, I was just going to ask Miles if he would congratulate Matthew Fuller on the way he's handled the slave stream to ISIS case. It's been absolutely textbook. He's um, collaborated with uh, the agent and with the owner. They've all reached a perfectly good compromise, and everybody's happy with the outcome. So absolutely first rate. Thank you. I can pass that on. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments on the appeal? Very quickly, I have a problem in that um, in um, Stonegate there is a beautiful manor house called um, Picklehurst Manor, and I've written to, I've written to Miles about it. Um, the owner is going absolutely sort of in a state, complete state of desperation. She cannot afford to keep the old school. The school ceased to exist a couple of years ago. We do need sometimes to look a bit more leniently at the um, financial implications of hanging out for an 18-month um, decision on whether the place is uh, commercially viable. In this case, it has proved not. Um, and both the estate agent um, and the owner have now spoken to me at length, and I've passed that message on that I really do think there are times when we should say enough is enough. Please, can we now take a sensible decision? There is a buyer. The buyer has now been in touch with me. He has said he's going to lose his buyer unless something happens quickly. So, you know, if that one could possibly come to the top of somebody's list, I would be very, very grateful. Well, I, yeah, I do recall it. And, um, you know, I'd say that policy um, isn't absolutely set in stone here. Having said that, um, they do have the option. I mean, they have the option to make that argument. And, um, you know, sometimes um, things do need to go to appeal. Sometimes that can actually prompt a change in culture. And that's not to say necessarily uh, the officer was wrong, but it is to say actually that things change over time. And, you know, for now, I mean... You know, it, it, that's what I would, that's how I would explain it. It's not set in stone, but they, they would be expected to provide some evidence. And if they feel they have and we're resisting it, then they do have the right of appeal. But it's like a lot of things. It's, um, there's been the, the business side, there's been the pragmatic side, but there's also the, the, the local plan and relevant policy guidance. And um, it's juggling all of those things and any other material planning consideration. I know what I'm saying is cliched, but it's cliched because it's true. Um, it's all part of looking at things perhaps in a slightly different way. And I think as the caseload now is beginning and those issues of backlog are beginning to play out gradually over time, we have a chance to look anew at culture at um, how we do things, how the service operates at uh, process. Miles, on so, that particular place, I mean, I, I know the school, I used to drive past that quite regularly, hadn't realised it was closed, actually. Um, I, would, I would have thought this was a good example to, if they brought forward an application to come to the committee, it's not a, it's not, it's the same mm. issue as we had with the, the, the London Road, the pub in the London Road, what was that called, the old Sussex, the Sussex, the Sussex yeah. Hotel, where where I think you know, the committee took the position that it hadn't gone through that full period, but um, it, you know, we approved the change of use on that. And that has been a successful application because they've done the job, they've built the units, they've got a nursery in there. So I think you know, that would be one to encourage the applicant to come forward and for you to bring it forward as an application to the committee, should, yeah. the, should the recommendation not be for approval. Well, thank you for that. But two things. First of all, the case officer was Chelsea York, who's now on maternity leave. Um, and the second thing is I've had the, the applicant, or rather the, the, the purchaser, the potential purchaser on the phone saying, I don't want to bring it to, um, uh, to, to, to submit a planning application because I think it will automatically be refused. So I said, well, no, I think you really ought to. So I will, you know, based on what you're saying, I will encourage him to apply. Um, but I hope he would get a speedy res response, please, um, Miles, if you don't well, the, the, the current applications, the new ones, are moving through in pretty good time, really. Yeah. 
I can't see why that should go to committee. I would have thought that would have been oh. just a sort of open and shut. Well, you have a look at it and see, talk to the officer, see what the recommended approval is or refusal yeah, and I'll, make yeah, a decision exactly. right up front. Okay. Uh, thank you, Miles. Any other questions on okay. the appeals? Yeah, <laughs> Councillor Langlands. <clears throat> it's not actually on appeals, but my question is, is there a possibility of having a policy that links to a retrospective planning commission? Because it really does irk me sometimes when people have done something and there's nothing that you can do about it. Is no. there no way? No, 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 no. There has Not been, there has been, there have been, uh, there have been suggestions <laughs> in Parliament, I think, even a private member's bill. Put what, what is the problem with it? I mean, in planning terms, it's <laughs> right. perfectly legitimate. It might go up your nose, but it's perfectly legitimate. This, this is a public transmission, Mark. Really? Hence, hence it, yes. I know it is, and, and oh, it, but yeah, yeah but is it, this it, it who's been, now uh, listening? They're out there. I mean, what, I'm saying, what I'm saying is this that, um, yeah. you know, it's a way of overcoming a breach. It's quite the whole legal process is most things not to criminalise breaches of planning because it's about remediation, it's not about punitive yeah. measures. And, and, to be fair, um, and quite different from other types yeah. of enforcement, say with nothing like strict liability, it's about how what's gone wrong, that's what enforce or notice says if it comes to that, and how do you put it right? And if a notice says that, then you know that's in the same spirit as um, inviting an application which you think in your judgment is likely to get planning permission. Yeah. So, I mean, now it may be that more information will come in potential with retrospective is it a you know is there likely to be higher fees I mean there are these possibilities but it is also sometimes when you're um, you've got enforcement it is a way of overcoming that I know we have a right sometimes decline to determine sometimes you'll be the best into an allowed application so we have to look at it that it's a perfectly legitimate avenue um, likewise, if, if someone under their own steam remediated something and you allowed them to do it, you could enforce, but ultimately, wouldn't, you know, it would be considered to be better to seek alternative arrangements. And there are things that are so harmful, they simply need to be enforced um, with alacrity. So, um, no, I can't, I'm sorry, we, we can't do anything about that in policy terms. Um, it must be judged on its own merits. There are, there, there are, there have been, as I said, some uh, moves in central government to double fees or do something like that. There are, there are a number of occasions where people do things and they didn't realise they should have got planning permission, and so you know they're not, they're, they're not doing it for the wrong. I mean, of course, there are people who do things for the wrong reasons, but yeah, as Miles said, it's uh, uh, no. <laughs> Thanks, Miles. Uh, any other Thank comments or questions for today? Well, that's been a little longer session today, and thank you, Miles, and Felicity's gone. We thanked her. Uh, and item 15 is just to note the next um, uh, site visit, which is the 19th of July, and there is no uh, committee meeting in August, just to remind everyone of that point. So thank you very much. Thank you, Miles, and we're going to stop the recording at that point. Thank you.